I'm not paying. I'm not paying him anymore. He <laughs> sent me the invoices for these things, and I am the one that has to pay them. I'm not doing it anymore. You gotta be. That is the best one that that Cameron and uh, Carl O'Hara have ever done ever. Ten no. out of ten, dude. Ten out of ten. Cameron said the voice to the camera, you're not getting your money. Not <laughs> I was not Welcome. expecting that at all. <laughs> Welcome to Kind of Funny's Jurassic Park in review. Just to get it out of our systems here, I just want to let everybody know how much I love Carter Harrell for making the music for our intros and how much I absolutely love Cameron Kennedy for making the motion graphics. Every once in a while, you know, I work with him and we try to plan out when things are happening. And he usually gets me things like a week before they're going to uh, be, be ready or all that stuff this was the latest he's ever got me one it was this morning he sends it well and he's literally it. just like dude i was just racking my brain i couldn't come up with what to do i couldn't figure it out and he's like then i had this idea and i was like <laughs> if i could go from nick being the old man to nick being the dinosaur maybe we can make it work and he made it work, everybody. So good. So I good. Can't. It's, it's so I can't good. even be mad at that. I just because wasn't just the expecting back anything like that. You hurting my back is such a thing. And that, was, that was pretty perfect. Kudos to you guys. Bravo. I just want you to know, though, that one's going on the list. And uh, pay back some other. You know what I'm talking about? I was just yeah. like, I, and I was like, well, I don't know where this is going. But th- it's funny that Nick is the old man. Oh, all oh, the back pain. Oh, he's now <laughs> hunched over. And he's the silhouette of the T-Rex in the logo. This is perfect. I yes. can't even be mad at that. It's you, so you, good. And Inspired. I'm, I'm, thank you. Thank you so much, everybody, for appreciating it as much as I do. Uh, I texted him, and I was like, oh, my God. This intro literally made me laugh out loud. And he goes, okay, thank God. I was thinking it was either going to be somewhat funny or just plain cruel. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's both. It's both. It's both. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, this is... Kind of Funny's Jurassic Park in review, where we will be ranking, reviewing, and recapping every movie in the Jurassic franchise. That includes Jurassic Park 1 through 3, and then Jurassic World 1 through 3, leading into the latest Jurassic World Dominion. We're going to be taking a short break in between the original trilogy and the sequel trilogy uh, to go back to MCU in review, where it all began doing a Doctor Strange rewatch, then Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, then Moon Knight, and then we'll catch back up with Jurassic, which is extremely, extremely exciting for everybody. This has been one of the longest awaited in review franchises ever. It is one of the few major franchises that we had left you know we've ran out of them we've done hundreds of episodes of this show this is one of the biggest franchises that still has movies coming out um and it's kind of the perfect in review series because there's some fantastic movies and then some really bad movies so it's going to give us that a lot of you're getting a lot of the, the best of in review i'm sure to come here um but i do want to apologize to a lot of people because uh the plan for a long time for me was this is the interview i wanted to debut in the new studio the plan behind the scenes was to have the studio done by april 1st which was last week and as you can see that did not happen we're still working very hard on it and it's looking awesome but we're still a ways away unfortunately and sometimes you just got to deal with what life throws at you and on top of that unfortunately nick do you have the the breaking news that just came breaking news tim unfortunately uh greg miller could not be with us on this podcast today he was walking down the street and a snake fell out of the sky just right on him so that's something we have to deal with now with sky snakes watch out if you're if you're in the greater california area make sure you look up i don't care Mm -hmm. what the netflix movie says california make sure you look up just all of california Mm-hmm. Some of mm-hmm. some of Nevada, a little Bay bit. Bay Area, especially. Yeah. yeah, a lot of the more yeah. venomous types in the Bay Area. Because it's hot, and Andy, when, when it's hot outside, a lot of people don't know this about the Bay Area. The snakes come out of the sky. Yeah, That's the humidity. Yeah. The humidity mm-hmm. can force them out of the stress. Look out for look out for certain cloud structures. Mm-hmm. They look like a snake. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> Uh, we're on a fucking roll, everybody. But again, like I said, I apologize that this isn't in studio. Trust me, I wish it was more than anyone else. But we're going to have a great time. Greg is going to join us next week, uh, starting with Jurassic with the Lost World, Jurassic Park, and then for the rest of the franchise. Uh, he wrote in his thoughts uh, that we'll get to later about this one. Uh, but let's get right into it. What's up, Joe? Oh, I just said later. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Um, Of course, this is in review. We rank, review, and recap different movie franchises. You can watch it on YouTube.com slash kindoffunny or roosterteeth.com. You can also get it as a podcast by searching your favorite podcast service for 
kind of funny in review and we'll be right there for you if you wanted to get the show live as we record it if you wanted to be able to contribute a haiku in review you got to go to patreon.com slash kind of funny just like our patreon producers molecule fargo brady pranksy and anonymous have all done thank you so very very much because they support us on patreon they also are getting the show ad free isn't that fantastic? Uh, and speaking of ads, today we're brought to you by Chime, DoorDash, and Babbel. But I'll tell you about those later. Guys, I just want to let you know right now. When it comes to interview, I, I like to take about an hour to prep the show, kind of look for some trivia, maybe watch some interviews and all that stuff. I had a blast today. And, you know, Jurassic Park is just one of those movies that there's just so much stuff. And I feel like no matter how many documentaries I see about this or read about this or whatever, I'm still learning shit that just makes me so excited. I'm excited to share a lot of that stuff with you today because today we're talking about Jurassic Park with a runtime of two hours and eight minutes despite being called jurassic park the dinosaurs only have around 15 minutes of screen time nine minutes are animatronics and six minutes are cgi this means that only around 11 percent of the film is dedicated to dinosaur scenes generally speaking any shot of a full dinosaur was computer generated but shots of parts of dinosaurs were of animatronics which is very cool uh, i was released on june 11th 1993 directed by the goat Steven Spielberg, who was having a really, really good year in 1993. Do you know why, Nick? Uh, I think he got an Academy Award, right? Or somewhere along, along there for Schindler's List. And he, yeah, Jurassic Park and Schindler's List in one year. Yeah. That's, so, by the way, Imagine. so he said that in an interview, I don't know if you have this piece of trivia, Tim, sorry to jump in, that he was, he was thankful for Jurassic Park because he was editing Schindler's List, I think, when he shot this movie. And he was like, it was so depressing to him. And he it put him in such a bad mental state that Jurassic Park like helped lift him out of that. So it was pretty cool that he had those two projects going the same. But I mean, imagine that workload where you're like, all right, I got, I, I'm in charge of like making this really deep Holocaust movie. And also we have to figure out how to somehow bring dinosaurs to life for the first time in a realistic fashion <laughs> uh, on, on film. It was pretty crazy. Yeah, it really is. Uh, a fact I read about him that I didn't know is Steven Spielberg refuses to record a director's commentary for any of his movies. Oh, interesting. That's a bummer. He was that also is. fucking lazy ass. Dang. Well, you know what? He was also one of those. He's one of those guys that's so quotable. And he's. I think. I think he's the one that said this quote, where he's like, "A movie's you never you never finish a movie, you just stop working on it." And that was one of those things where, like, I, that's probably why he doesn't like doing commentaries because I think he probably just looks back and sees all the flaws in them. But this is one of those movies where, like, if you don't have the Blu-ray or if you don't if you don't have access. Look online and try to find behind the scenes on this. Watch the movies that made us. There's a great episode about this because all the shit they did to get this movie done was is so cool. Yeah, ton of cool stuff. I mean, stay on the the date there, Nick. Uh, did you see this in theaters? I did. I saw this wow. in theaters. Not That's only did crazy. I see how this in theaters, I read so it. It's it's funny. Um, I was just looking up the uh, the actors and see to see how old they are right now. And the actress that played Lex is my age. So mm. I saw this movie when I was whatever age she was when she filmed this movie, which is crazy. Uh, well, it was 94, so that's easy to do the math. I would have been 14. 93. 14 years old. 93. So I would have been, I would have been uh, 13 years old when I saw this. Wow. And I was so into the hype of this movie. Mind you, I didn't, I didn't care about dinosaurs. But this was such a big deal coming out that I actually sat down and read the book beforehand, which I don't the recommend Crichton doing. Book? Yeah, because everyone was like, <laughs> Michael Crichton. kind of a lot for a 13-year-old, right? I, went to, I, I read Jurassic Park, I read Sphere, and I read Rising Sun. And I was like, wow, these are kind of adult books, especially Rising Sun. Um, but they were making, this was when there was just a run on Michael Crichton movies or books. So if you guys remember... There was Jurassic Park. There was Sphere came out with Dustin Hoffman, uh, Samuel L. Jackson again, and uh, and Sharon Stone. And then Rising Sun came out with Wesley Snipes and Sean Connery. And those are all like they, that. That just kind of started the era of. Well, actually, I guess Michael Crichton had a couple movies made prior to that, like Andromeda Strain and stuff like this. But in the '90s, his his I think his books really kind of got hot. Andy, you said you watched it in theaters as well. Yeah, I was four years old. This was the wow. this was the like the pinnacle of everything that I had wanted at, at the time. I was like super into dinosaurs. I was basically the little kid in the movie. Like I, I was <laughs> reading all about them. I had like every goddamn zoo book about dinosaurs. I was just like, I was obsessed. It was an obsession, uh, constantly drawing them. Um, yeah, it was like, it, 
it was like it went from dinosaurs to tornadoes with the movie Twister. But <laughs> oh, like, Twister! Dinosaurs Twister had their rings. had their time uh, for sure. Where it's like I I remember um, this old book named Dinotopia, where it showed it was like a fantasy book, but it showed humans and dinosaurs living together and how the dinosaurs be would be used for practical means of like transportation and construction and stuff like that i was like this is the coolest shit i, I just fucking loved dinosaurs man i was just oh, all about on. them bro all about exactly them. man uh, so were so were a lot of other people because this movie in the book generated so much interest in dinosaurs that the study of paleontology had a record increase in students and that colleges across right. america had to add more classes that's, that's awesome cool. that's great <laughs> kevin what's up i was gonna say andy do you know that dinotopia became a mini series i don't remember where it was on but it was good from what i remember really there's the, there's the poster mm. wow we i had no idea i just had the i had the hardcover book if you google dinotopia uh the third picture on the top or even like the the first one on the second row that's like that the hardcover book that I had. And I didn't even know I didn't know what the fiction was. I didn't know if there was even a story. All I remember was just looking at these awesome pictures of like dinosaurs and humans living together and it was the coolest shit of all time. And then I became a hardcore creationist. Oh, just, good. That's right. a joke. <laughs> uh, moving on with this, uh, the movie was produced by Kathleen Kennedy. That's always fun to see her pop up in the, the earlier stuff. Uh, it was based on the 1990 novel of the same name by Michael Crichton. Before his novel was published, four studios put in bids for the film rights. Before the novel even came out, they're just like, yo. People are going to like dinosaurs. Let's see how this goes. Uh, with the backing of Universal Studios, Spielberg acquired the rights for $1.5 million before it was published in 1990. Crichton was also hired for an additional $500,000 to adapt it to screen as well as a substantial percentage of the gross money that Jurassic Park makes. Uh, Coep ended up writing the final draft, which left out much of the novel's exposition and violence and made numerous changes to the characters. Uh, Steven Spielberg received $250 million from the movie's gross and profit participants. Holy yeah. Shit. So and you know what? He made he a good every investment. Penny of that. Yeah. He deserves any, mm -hmm. every penny of that because this was an undertaking for 93. Nowadays, they could, I mean, the newer ones they can make in a, in a heartbeat. But in this one, I'll never forget he was talking about how the thing that, that sold him on it was that he saw them do the demo of the dinosaurs. And then the guy was like, he was like, oh, it's going to be so cool, but I wish we could move the camera. Like, I, I would love this scene to be more dynamic. And the CG guy was like, oh, you can move the camera. We can motion track. And he goes, what? And so, like, if you see a lot of the CG of the era, you'll see, like, the, the shots are really locked in or they're simple shots. And in this one, even some of the shots that it, in the kitchen where the camera's, like, revolving around and the, and the raptor comes around, like, that shit, we hadn't seen shit like that back in 93. Now it's obviously commonplace. Do you yeah, remember crazy. Tim when uh when we did VUSQ on VUSQ universe mm -hmm. and we talked about how like this was like the movie that your friends brothers watched to be like I'm a film guy right like I'm <laughs> I'm into Kevin Smith movies this is an unknown indie you've never heard of uh I remember having that same feeling that same sort of vibe when my brother had the Michael Crichton novel and then having him tell me like all oh, there's stuff in here that isn't even in the movie and i'd be like whoa i tell my friends like dude this stuff has stuff that isn't even in the movie man that's like, awesome <laughs> it was totally like all oh, the book is better like it was one of those sort of things you know yeah that's great dinosaur hipsters yeah. uh james cameron has stated <laughs> that he wanted to make this movie but the rights were bought a few hours before he could oh. Upon seeing this movie cameron man. realized that spielberg was the better choice yeah, to direct it and his, his career version. went nowhere <laughs> Never did his version else. would have been much more violent he quoted it as aliens with dinosaurs yeah. oh. again uh, which give us that because we, we talked that. about we talked about one day i think it was um i forget what we what show we were on but i was like why don't we have more dinosaurs in media why does jurassic park have the exclusive rights to dinosaurs even though they don't it's just why doesn't anybody else attempt these and some people in the comments are like and you just watched a good dinosaur. I'm not talking about fucking like CG cartoons. I right. mean, like, why don't we ever really see? Uh, and I'm sure there's like a tornado velociraptor movie sort of bullshit sci fi thing. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But why don't other directors, right? Was the yeah, Velocipaster, with Mike. that's one of them. <laughs> but like, I, I don't know. It's just why doesn't Hollywood attempt this again? Does it feel like it has to be a Jurassic Park movie to be dinosaurs? Like, what the hell's going on there, guys? No idea. Is there a conspiracy here? There's a dino spiracy. 
Yep. Thank you, Dick. Thank Spirosaurus. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but James, yeah, James Cameron said that uh, uh, if, if it was aliens with dinosaurs, it wouldn't have been fair to children who just love dinosaurs. Fuck yeah, we do. Like, it's dude. true. Yeah. 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 Um, the music was done by an American composer named John Williams, who's Never best known for scoring a movie called Hook in the okay. 90s mm-hmm. weird mm-hmm. i don't remember that yeah. i don't remember the soundtrack on that one tim can you sing me a couple licks of the hook soundtrack <laughs> oh yeah that's it <laughs> Yo, hook has a banger fucking soundtrack jokes aside uh but this movie had a production budget of 63 million dollars which is crazy to think about how low that is for what yeah. this movie is however there was a lot of money that went into marketing as well. The dinosaurs were created with groundbreaking CGI by ILM and with life-sized animatronic dinosaurs built by Stan Winston's team. To showcase the film's sound design, which included a mixture of various animal noises for the dinosaur roars, Spielberg invested in the creation of DCS, a company specializing in digital surround sound formats. The film also underwent an extensive $65 million marketing campaign. So oh even gosh. more than the production of the movie itself. 65 included, million years in the making was the tagline. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Which included licensing deals with over 100 companies. Uh, and then in terms of box office, this is where it gets real. Joey Noel, what's up? Sorry, I have a question I've been thinking about since you mentioned it. Does John Williams exclusively score Spielberg movies? Like, no. Not, I mean, he. I know he does other stuff, but does anybody else score Spielberg movies? That's a good question. I'm sure Ooh, Spielberg's worked question. with other people, bef- like on different stuff. I don't know, like I don't think I mean, he's he just scored, did like, West Side Story, eight, you know. Yeah, that's all Bernstein, yeah. but I mean, you can't you can't have John Williams come in and score that. That's that's a classic composer. But that's a good question, Joe. I'm gonna look that up. Yeah, it's a really good because I feel like that's yeah. a lot of Spielberg movies. That he's the majority done, right? of them, yeah. But I'm like Bridge of Spies album? probably wasn't John Williams. I'm gonna say like Minority Report. Wait, was that Spielberg? Yeah, Wonderful. Minority Report was yeah, Spielberg. Say, what a fucking movie, dude. Great and it was John great Williams. Great John Williams did Minority Damn. Report. What about Bridge of Spies? John Williams did Empire of the Sun. Well, that's a classic. John Williams did not do The Color Purple. Okay. He did okay. not do The Color Purple. So there you go. There it is. How about that? How about that? Uh, in terms of box office, over a billion dollars. Dollars. Following Ooh. the 3D re-release in 2013 to celebrate its 20th anniversary, Jurassic Park became the 17th and to this day oldest film in history to surpass a billion dollars in ticket sales. Wow. It was the highest grossing film of 1993. It outdid Steven Spielberg's own E.T. from 1982 as the then biggest box office success in film history, not adjusted for inflation. It would hold that record until Titanic and then James Cameron would outperform himself with the release of Avatar in 2009. Uh, It was also the first movie ever to cross the 400 uh, and $500 million marks at the international box office. In terms of awards, the film won more than 20 awards, including three Academy Awards for its technical achievements in visual effects and sound design. In 2018, the film was selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry by the Library of Congress as being culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant. Joey Noel, what do yes. you think about Jurassic Park? I fucking love this movie. This is like the perfect movie in my opinion this is a movie that we have watched in my family every single year on thanksgiving (laughs) since like i can remember so i feel like this is up i don't know i think it started because we wanted to show my cousin and he was like younger than us and then we we scarred him (laughs) for like a significant number of years every year we watched like a little bit more with him as he got older um but so this is up there on like my most watched movies of all time probably and like every time i get to watch it it is a joy it's one of the movies that anytime it's on tv i have to watch it it's just it's so good the story is perfect like a dinosaur theme park yes (laughs) i feel like that's you don't have to really sell a whole lot for it the performances are amazing the i feel like i'm never one to like notice the musical beats and interludes and how it weaves into the movies like you guys are I feel like much better at that and this is one where I had like multiple notes about like just the timing and the shots and the music like the way that everything swells together is so good and like it's a two-hour movie and it is like a significant chunk of time but it never feels like too long it doesn't feel like there's like that much bloat that would need to be cut from it like it's perfect and I wished that the rest of the movies were also as good. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but yeah, I was really stoked to be able to rewatch it. And it, it's so good. It's so there's like Nedry is such a great, annoying 
villain character to hate the dynamics between uh sam neill and laura dern and jeff goldblum or so like it's just it's perfect uh, a fun fact about uh wayne knight there for nedry was steven spielberg chose to catch wayne knight after seeing his performance in basic instinct and he said oh. i waited for the credits to roll to write his name down because i knew he was the bad guy oh that's awesome <laughs> so can you imagine horrible. having that endorsement from steven spielberg that's like, so fucking on. cool. Yeah, I thought he was gonna say like, "Man, after Space Jam, this guy was the guy." I thought he was gonna say <laughs> Seinfeld. I was like, I watched the first season of Seinfeld with, with uh, Newman, and actually, he's not even in the first season. Sorry, but that'd be <laughs> incredible. <laughs> Nick, what'd you think? Uh, I mean, I love this movie. You know, I remember picking up the book when I was a kid. I remember like hearing the movie was being made, and then I think it was my mom who was like, "Oh, I think," or maybe I like walked into a Barnes and Noble. Who the hell knows? But I remember seeing Jurassic Park on sitting on the on the stands because the movie. I think the book came out before the movie. And I remember thinking, like, I read the back of it. And I didn't, I'm, I'm not a reader. Even to this day, it takes me months to get through a single book. And as a child, I was like, I'm sorry, anything good. I, I, I felt under the, the concept of anything good would be made into a movie anyway. So why bother reading it? But I remember sitting there and I was so captivated by the thought of exactly what Joey just said. An amusement park full of dinosaurs. I just thought that idea was so brilliant. And that at the heart is why this movie was, is so damn good. It's such a cool concept. The idea of like reverse engineer or, or and, uh, you know, cloning dinosaurs that you found DNA from, from these mosquitoes and the amber is such a cool, mysterious thing. And then as a child, you know, 13 years old, I would have loved to have gone to this place and seen real dinosaurs. Probably would have stayed away from anything that had to do with velociraptors or T-Rexes. Maybe that's where we went wrong there, John Hammond. Uh, but this is one of those movies that getting to see it in theaters, getting to getting, I remember being caught up in the hype of Jurassic Park and then watching it and having it deliver, um, when you're a kid at just every single note, similar to how I felt with 89 Batman, where I'm like, I hope this is as good as I want to be. And you want, you go in and you're just, your expectations are blown away. Um, yeah, this movie was instant classic status when I walked out of the theaters. Andy Cortez. Yeah, same, man. Like, there's very few perfect movies, I think, and I think this is a perfect movie. Um, it just... It, when when Nick talks... Nick and Joey mentioned having the idea of this theme park, and it seems so practical as well. Like, it, nothing about it seems a, seems too far-fetched, and I think they approach it from a reali realistic enough angle of investors and lawyers and people worried about the safety of it, but if we can get your endorsement... And really, at the end of the day, it's like if Sam Neill and Ellie just didn't, you know, were like, if they didn't just sell their souls to, for a three year, uh, okay. for a three Come year on. You dig. You know how hard it is to get a, a dig funded these days? It's difficult. <laughs> <laughs> None of this would have happened, you know, but sometimes you got to sell out and it's kind of just, you know. Um, but I just I just love the angles that they take uh, storytelling wise. And obviously, all the characters are just so classic. Uh, this is just one of the all time great movies. Um, and I think now, like when we talk about when we mentioned Minority Report earlier, and it's like, God, the Steven Spielberg Minority Report, Jurassic Park, Saving Private Ryan. Like what what would be rank number one? E. On his fucking Jaws. List? Like there's Jesus so many good ones. Christ. Oh, yeah, uh, Close Encounters. All these movies are great. Yeah. God damn. Yeah, yeah, this, is really, really good. You're this talking about. Just, a, oh, sorry. Yeah. I was gonna say you're just talking about a guy that defined the '80s. This is the guy that's like single-handedly made blockbuster, the, the term blockbuster, a thing with Jaws, right? Like this guy, Indiana people Jones. don't rem what's that? Indiana Jones and Indiana Jones, mm -hmm. the Indiana Jones series, right? This guy just was a <clears throat> hit maker all throughout the '80s and '90s, and still to this day is making great movies. But like, if you're 15 or 16, you're eight, you know, years old, and you're listening to this, and you're like Steven Spielberg, that guy. You have no, like, there was, like, three or four people that just made 80s cinema a thing. And Steven Spielberg is one of them. I would put Arnold Schwarzenegger up there as well as one of those guys that did, that they were on, like, the same level as far as, like, owning fucking movies in that decade. It was unbelievable. This guy's, like, responsible for my entire childhood. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this movie's just just very, very, very good. Um, and upon rewatching it, repeating a bunch of lines it's like this i had this memory or i had this movie memorized like the back of my hand it's just uh it's incredibly good um and i think from front to back there are kind of like no flaws in it i think people can point to um to the hacking scene and just how like kind of far-fetched that may be but like 
I don't know, man. I think this movie is as good as any other movie out there. And um, yeah, I just I love this. And this kind of just started the fascination of dinosaurs for me. Yeah, I have not seen this movie as anywhere near an adult. Like I had only seen it when I was little. I'd seen, you know, the the sequels and stuff. Like, honestly, I've probably even seen some of the sequels more than I've seen this one, which is sacrilege i know mm. uh but watching it now um fresh off of watching west side story a couple weeks ago uh with steven spielberg it's just crazy how good he is and how much control he has over the camera and style like there's just moves you're like that's spielberg you know he did that and what i what i keep thinking about is the word iconic every single thing about this movie is iconic mm. from the camera work to <clears throat> obviously the score to the characters like there is something to be said about the fact that people can cosplay as every single character in this mm, movie exactly. and a room full of people would know exactly yeah. who they are, no matter how obscure, no matter what the prop is, like the shaving cream. Like there's just so many things with like those type of elements. This might be the most gift movie of all time. Like how often do we use Jurassic Park gifts to respond to people on Twitter for any type of emotion you're feeling. And I think that that's something that's so impressive about this movie as well is that I think it works on kind of th three different levels where there is just this ridiculous level of awe and wonder of kids seeing dinosaurs for the first time. They present that with the score and with just like the characters themselves being just blown away Amazed by what by they're it. seeing. You yeah. know, like it's rare we get that type of moment in a movie, especially for for us to be able to connect and, and feel the same thing their characters are but to have that in the same movie that is scary as all hell these same things you were just blown away by are now the scariest things in the entire world and that's backed up with some of the most iconic sound design of all time uh and then on top of that there's this layer of like this movie's actually trying to say something like it's not just oh let's put a bunch of uh monsters on an island and see what happens it's like there is a story that backs it up that has to do with like profiting off of this shit and like the what you'll sell out for what you believe in or yeah, don't the believe commodification in and, of that yeah and mm -hmm. and all of that and it's just like when you kind of look at it as Ham hammond being this like deranged walt disney uh, to an extent you know like it just makes it so much more fascinating and this already incredibly engaging uh film but on top of that just the amount of lines of dialogue that like andy was saying it's like you can just quote and like everyone has one you know and like going back to what i was saying about the costuming it's like just the the colors that each character wears like to to see sam neil and laura dern next to each other it's like it's this red and blue that it's like at any moment you're looking at the screen and you know what's happening who's mm -hmm. where and, and like it kind of just evokes emotion already uh just like just any still of this film evokes emotion. Like this might be the single most iconic movie of all time. And that's up there with back to the future and a new hope star Wars. And, all and that. like, it's just, it's crazy that like it's, and, and Oh, I didn't even talk about the logo, you know, the gates, <laughs> yeah. the Jeeps, like every single element, every single decision of this movie is iconic and it lives up to the, the icons are all 10 out of 10. It all gets that mm -hmm. score where it's not just iconic for, you know, people like it or it's hype or whatever. It's like, no, this this does it all. I'll say, to, to riff off one of your points there, that's one of the things I really like about this movie is it's kind of two movies in one, right? Uh, how, in the beginning of it is sort of, is a sci-fi movie. It's talking about the the excitement and like the, 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 I guess you guys call it commodification, but like basically the excitement of this scientific discovery. And I would actually argue that like, I don't see Hammond as the bad guy of this. I don't see him as deranged at all. I see it all perfectly summed up. Like the antagonism in this movie is perfectly summed up in that one great Jeff Goldblum line where he's like, your scientists were so like caught up with whether they could, they didn't stop to think if they should. And that really is sort of the main theme of this whole movie is like, it's not necessarily science run amok. It's not like someone's like abused the power. It's how far should we go with science? What are the moral ramifications of like pushing the limits with science? Um, and he has that moment where he's like, he ha he reflects on it for a second and he goes, oh, I know what we'll do. The next one will be perfect. We'll have more control. And she goes, you can't, there is no such thing as control. It's just an illusion and all that stuff. So I, I always love that part of the movie almost more than sort of the survival horror nature of the movie, which takes over right when everything starts going bonkers. That part is really, really fun. But as an adult, when I go back, I look forward to the first like 
hour of this movie where they're just sitting around the, the chaos table. theory. You know? Yeah, the chaos theory of, <laughs> of Jeff Goldblum being like, you think you can't, you can control all this stuff, but this is just way out of your league of control. And then the, and then that pushback from Hammond of being like, well, I've got billions of dollars and I can, I can, we can control this. We will control this. And, and he even says, he's like, he even says like all innovation comes with this level of like, of, 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 of not risk. Chaos. Yeah. Of risk. Right. And, and he's not wrong. Right. In order to do stuff, you have to take risks. Um, and I just thought that was so, it's so cool that they do that. Cause you can't really like, there's not like the traditional bad guy like there is coming up in some of the newer ones where it's just like a bad, like I guess Nedry can kind of be seen as the antagonist. Yeah. Is, the, but the, he's not really like the, he's not really the person they all go against. He just kind of set all this crap in motion for personal gain. Yeah, Nick, this isn't like, this isn't a situation where Hammond knows that these dinosaurs are seeking human blood. Right. And we're going to put these people here anyway because I think I'm good. It's just like, he, he just kind of wants to bring that wonder to the to the big world and it's not necessarily making millions off it he even mentions to that one lawyer like no i don't want this just to be a rich person's rich theme park yeah, i want for everybody to experience this sort of thing and i think it's just sort of, i think you get so caught up in the wonder and the awe of all of it that you don't really see the dangers at hand because you just they're just kind of these majestic creatures in the same way that you know, we hear these horror stories about lion tamers and mm -hmm. tiger tamers that eventually get killed or whatever, because one day the animal just snaps. It's like because you can't control that wild thing, you know. Right. Yeah. Before we uh, move on to the sponsors, I want to go around the table. Is there anything you guys don't like about this movie? Uh, I'll start. I feel like because it was a smaller budget, I think that some of the takes it always stood out to me like a few of the takes of some of the acting. I'm like, wow, he really went with that take. Like there was just <laughs> it's specifically, there's always the one, the couple scenes that really stand out to me. But one of them is when Hammond's there it meeting them in their, in their um, trailer, their reactions, they kind of step on each other's lines and it kind of feels not as like clean and perfect as. Oh, Spielberg. I love it. Oh, I, I never liked that. Like I, I it seems I so Laura natural Dern, to me. But it's Laura Dern's reaction in the back where I'm like, I really wish we'd gotten like a couple more takes of this. And I wish we had yeah. more coverage yeah. of it because it just feels like it was the first couple takes and they Fuck just you, had Kevin. to move on. <laughs> no, but I mean, honestly, I think, I think Stop Laura, this Laura Dern slander. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, I don't want to play into that joke because I think Laura Dern's phenomenal in this. And I think I think the whole cast is a great job. But there's just there's moments in this movie that I kind of think you feel like they you kind of feel the budget of it a little bit. Um, but, but I will say on a positive note, I think the thing that stands out as one of the best things in this whole movie is the animatronics. I'm always, it's always that one shot where the Raptor walks up to the kitchen door and breathes and the breath hits the, the, the window. That's fucking terrifying. And you can't, it's just so hard. To, I mean, you could do that with CG and I'm sure it would probably be close to it, but it's so it, that the fact that these things were practical really, really sold it for me. I don't know. I can't really think of what I don't like. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Like, I'll tell you, okay, you know what? Here's what I don't like. I don't like the sequence when they, they finally, you know, obviously it's the most magical, one of the most magical moments in cinematic history. They see the fucking uh, Brachiosauruses and the Brontosauruses and, and they, they do, they do um, run in, in, in moving herds. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking beautiful i'm like got tears in my eyes and then they cut to the scene where they're going back to the park mm -hmm. and it's just like the most john williams naboo star wars theme <laughs> i've ever heard in my life it's like your cricket it reminds you of the yeah. it reminds you of the theme of the <laughs> theme that goes it reminds me yeah. of like that sort of star and i'm like this doesn't feel like jurassic park right now <laughs> like yeah. it feels like these are soldiers going on a mission and that's the only part that ever kind of throws me off um that's funny that you bring that up because one of the notes that i have is at the end when they're on the helicopter and they're leaving whatever however they recorded that version of the uh theme song sounds like a richard marx <laughs> movie and it's just like weirdly like romanticized and i'm like mm -hmm. this also feels very weird and is like a weird tone to end on like an epic movie um the only other thing is like yeah the part where she's hacking is like annoying but i just have always hated that 
the way that she holds her mouth, she has like her pointer finger down, and all the rest of her fingers are straight up. Yeah, I'm like, who that's holds a good point. Yeah. Like I love, I love that this is where we're at. What do you like about Shazu? I don't like how she holds the mouth. Yeah, like, yeah that's what a great point. Point. The movie. I love it. And that's like such a testament to how good yeah. this movie is that Ooh. it's just like these little tiny you know things. Yeah, let me jump in. You know what's crazy about that, Joey? It's possible because it was 1993. That was the first time that actor ever held a mouth. <laughs> Like, it's possible that she just didn't really interact with computers that much. Yeah. I, I love that we're getting to the small, super nitpicky stuff that is, like, just doesn't matter at all. When she is trapped in the kitchen and she's trying to close the thing and the animatronic raptor feet are going, boo, boo, boo. And it's this the shot from the ground following. Mm -hmm. And all you see is the raptor's feet. And it's clearly just, like, somebody's hands just, like... Yeah kind of stomping there's like no articulation in anything oh, it's just no it, oh like no part, though I no like, but there's that part like where none, of them... none of it rolls none of it does like anything it's just oh, okay. like two like stumps that just kind of like hit see, the ground i think they see i think they they threw, they got me with this one because that's that's one of my favorite parts of the animatronic because it stops and the little the hook goes ca -ca -ca, and like taps against the ground a couple times and that totally distracted me i never even noticed that it didn't really actually move like a real foot would hmm uh for me like nick alluded to this a little bit with the the breath um but one of the things i love most about this movie is how anytime i'm kind of just watching it and like oh i'm watching a movie something will happen one minute later and i'm like i'm in jurassic park like i just <laughs> i believe it so much mm -hmm. i believe in the dinosaurs they do such a great job of so many things just making this fantastical shit believable and i feel like they deliver on exposition so well will there be a set anything that any line of dialogue in the first half of this movie gets a payoff in the second half every single thing and it's perfect the least believable thing of this entire movie is laura dern and alan grant the whole kid thing i hate the kid what thing. The actual fuck, man. It is I one of the, the most kids. bizarre plots ever. And these two children who are not related to them at all meet them for the first time. And I'm sure I know they're going through some like really, really traumatic moments. But these teenage people, like 11, whatever, 12, 13, whatever age these fucking kids are, are cuddling up with this man. And he's just like <laughs> rubbing their heads and shit. And like, it's like, what the actual fuck? Like, this is inappropriate any way you shake it. And I just love that almost every line of dialogue between them that's not about dinosaurs, it's about like, I just don't like kids. I don't like kids at all. <laughs> it's like, you can have something else to say about this. <laughs> but that's, that's the worst thing I had to say about Jurassic Park. I'm right there with you. I The kids, to me, as I, as I get older even when i watched when i was a kid because i think you know steven spielberg loves it and act and directors love to put kids in the movies because it's a kid's movie right so you want to see someone up there that kind of reflects you and, and how you would be in this environment and when i was 13 i was like cool but even me at 13 i was like these kids are fucking annoying i don't like them i, do, I don't like that they're you know just gives alan grant someone to save um but again i think it's because the things of the movie that i like most is really just the concept and the conceptualized like or, or just the the, what this movie is actually about on its fundamental basis the, the adventure part of it the movie the movie to me the adventure part of it was never really like the fun part in fact one of the scenes that i love most was when they just randomly stop and laura dern's like what's going on over there and they just sit and talk about the triceratops and she that's the poop scene the where she reaches the poop and 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 I, w even watching now i'm like i'm actually way more interested in that then I end the last 30 minutes of this movie where they're running around and finding Samuel L. Jackson's arm, like, and all that stuff. Like, that stuff is, it's fine, it's fun, and it's well choreographed action. But the concept of Laura Dern being like, you have lilac here, and that's super deadly. And the guy's like, well, they're, we don't, they don't eat him. And she goes, I think they, I mean, I'm like, what? I want to know more about that. Like, I want to <laughs> know more about her. As if it's a real dino. Yeah, yeah, as if it's a real I, thing. I, just, yeah. I always think that's let, really me, cool. uh, let me drop some knowledge for you. Please. Whoa. Whoa. Science, science, science with Tim. Tim, Tim. <laughs> uh, I'm just reading facts that I read uh, that may or may not be true. Uh, the guest encounter with the sick it. Triceratops ends without any clear explanation as to why the animal is sick. Michael Crichton's original novel and the screenplay, however, include an explanation. The Stegosaurus slash Triceratops lacked suitable teeth for grinding food, and so, like birds, would swallow rocks and use them as gizzard stones. In the digestive tract, these rocks would grind the food to aid in digestion after six weeks the rocks would become too smooth to be useful and the animal would regurgitate them when finding and eating new rocks to use the animal would also swallow the west indian lilac berries the fact that the berries and stones are regurgitated explains why ellie never finds traces of them in the animal's mm. excrement mm. Wow. pretty See, damn that's cool. cool that's really yeah. cool 
Like they could have just made this like a this this movie could have just been a drama about these two people like <laughs> grappling with the concept that they no longer needed because he's a paleontologist and they have di- and dinosaurs are real. You could literally remake this without any of the horror shit and just put them on the island and have them have to find a new purpose. And I would be riveted by that for two and a half. Do you just I, want, I, like, I love a Nick talk- show? I was gonna say I yeah. love Nick talking from the perspective that like this movie sucked because it wasn't that like i love it oh, Nick no, started, not, i love yeah. it nick started coming from this angle of like see that's what they could have done but they fucked up <laughs> i know i'm sure quarterback in this. no i'm not i mean obviously this is this movie is great and i love it but I, but those yeah. are the parts that i find like they just introduce a lot of interesting ideas here that they don't really of course have time to touch on but one of them is like hey we're i'm an archaeologist i'm a paleontologist i study dinosaur bones and now dinosaurs are real so what do i do now and it's like kind of an exciting concept of like well of course they need you to like go over there and work with the dinosaurs like that sounds pretty cool and then of course i will say this tim one of the only things that i never noticed i never noticed this line like the 20 times i've seen this movie is the lysine contingency do you remember that did you guys pick up on this line Mm-mm. i have no. never until i was actually like watching this to take notes i didn't even know this was a thing at one point Samuel L. Jackson is talking to Muldoon, the guy that's like the hunter. And he goes, yeah, what should we do? Yada, yada. He goes, we got to reset the system. And he goes, what about the lysine contingency? And Samuel goes, what's the lysine contingency? And he goes, oh, uh, Dr. Wu uh, spliced in a thing of DNA where these people have like a, the, the, all the dinosaurs have a lysine deficiency. We have to give them lysine. Otherwise, they die. They go into a coma and die. And that just never comes back in the movie. And I think it's what, how we explain that if they get off the island, like, it's going to be okay, but we never revisit this idea ever again in any of the Jurassic Parks that I know of. Oh wow! So, I, I don't know why that that line just totally passed. Because it's a me. it's a one little throwaway line that they probably should have edited it out because it didn't need to be in the movie. But it's it's just very. I'm like, whoa, that's kind Is of it, a fucking heavy idea. Like you can kill all these animals just by not just by not giving them this one amino acid. That sucks. Immediately, I thought it was maybe one of those lines that happens where, like, where they're over the raptor pit talking to each other. And you're just and there's like different conversations happening at once. And yeah. so I and you're I distracted by everything happening. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't like that. Oh, by the way, the Raptor Pit. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead, Tim. We'll get to uh, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we'll get to a lot of stuff when we get to the plot. But before we get to the plot, let me tell you about our sponsors. You've got back-to-back meetings, errands to run, and chores to take care of. What's the secret to clearing your to-do list? A little help from DoorDash. You can get dinner, household essentials, and everything on your grocery list delivered. I'm going to pause the ad and tell you, ladies and gentlemen, how do I know so much about DoorDash? I used it this morning. I I woke up. I had to get the house ready. I I had this guy coming to work on the garage. I had the nanny coming over. We had no clean bottles. I cleaned the bottles and everything. And I was like, I'm hungry and I need coffee and I don't have time to make either. I door dashed uh, Jen and I some breakfast today and it was great. When I was sick last week, I door dashed Gatorade because I wasn't about to go out. Door dash is great. Back to what they wrote. Ordering is easy and your items will be left safely outside your door when you choose contactless delivery drop off. For a limited time, our listeners can get 25% off and zero delivery fees on their first order of $15 or more when you download the DoorDash app and enter the code KINDAFUNNY. That's 25% off up to a $10 value and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the App Store and enter the code KINDAFUNNY. Don't forget, that's code KINDAFUNNY for 25% off your first order with DoorDash, subject to change, terms apply. For most of us, learning a second language in high school or college wasn't exactly a high point in our academic careers. I took three years of French and guess what? It didn't stick. Now, thanks to Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, there's an addictively easy and fun way to learn a new language. Whether you'll be traveling abroad, connecting in a deeper way with family, or just have some free time, Babbel teaches you bite-sized language lessons that you'll actually want to use in the real world. Uh, je parle un peu français, and I was talking to Jen's mom here and there about little things, mon chapeau, you know what it's about. Other language learning apps use AI for their lesson plans, but Babbel lessons were created by over 100 language experts. With Babbel, you can choose from 14 different languages, including Spanish, French, Italian, and German. Plus, Babbel's speech recognition technology helps you improve your pronunciation and accent. I could use that for English. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, you can save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com slash kindoffunny. That's babbel.com slash kindoffunny for up to 60% off your subscription. Babbel language for life. No one likes waiting on a paycheck, especially when you've got bills due. Good thing there's Chime. Now you can get your paycheck up to two days early with direct deposit. That's up to two more days to save, pay bills, and generally just feel good about your money situation. But Chime is more than just getting paid early. It's also an award-winning mobile app, checking account, debit card, and optional savings account. 
So what are you waiting for? Hopefully not your paycheck. Get started with Chime today. Applying for a free account takes less than two minutes. Get started at Chime.com slash KF Games. That's Chime.com slash KF Games. Banking services and debit card provided by the Bancorp Bank and Stride Bank NA members FDIC. Early access to direct deposit funds depend on the payer. Andy. It's time for the, it is time for the plot. Nick, say the plot. It's time for the plot. There are dinosaurs. Just made that up right now, everybody. That was wow. <laughs> no, it. Tell. Really good. <laughs> I, 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 I finished the synopsis for this movie a little too late last night, but I was going to write my own song about how Andy never uh, invites me to his birthday parties. Hey, Jurassic Park. <laughs> it's scary in the dark, Tim. Life. Uh, uh, uh. Uh, uh, it was either gonna be uh, that or where'd the goat where's the goat <laughs> that was my second favorite line of this whole movie sometimes <laughs> something big is moving through the jungle and honestly this is another one of those moments where i'm like i never noticed this shot before but he's so good at like at, at his trade at this point in his career that steven spielberg totally trips you out you think it's a dinosaur coming through the bushes but it's not it is in fact a cage carrying velociraptor uh coming through the the palm trees uh on a uh a forklift and we are on isla nublar uh love how this is shot love this whole thing here uh you think it's a big dinosaur no it's a velociraptor which let me tell you one thing right now guys right off right off the bat you're making jurassic park tim what's your first, what's your go-to dinosaur that you want to make that kids want to come see it's what do you the think the t-rex, the t-rex, the t-rex right yeah did we even know what a velociraptor was before this movie i had no idea i didn't why know. but why in god <laughs> well, of course because you're you're fundamentalist you're what, what is it creationist, creationist. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things where, like the only be- unbelievable thing about this movie is that they were like let's breed velociraptors be the, the the most dangerous fucking animal on the planet. Let's breed them so kids can come watch them tear apart a cow, but which you can't so even cool. see because they decided in the Velociraptor pit to put so many trees. You can't see these deadly fucking 60 mile an hour sea sharks or, or land sharks. You can't see these things anywhere. But anyway, I digress. Shooter! <laughs> in reality. Shooter! Oh my God, man. I'll never in, forget that. In reality, was the fucking... The velociraptors were actually like a third the size they are in the movie. They're that significantly makes, smaller. That's still scary. It's even still scary. 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 I, I um, Steven Spielberg was saying a whole bunch of things where he wanted to make the, them like taller, uh, to be like more scary. And like he was like, you know what? We're playing with all the the, yeah. the real shit of this. Like these things need to be a very specific cause. And it was just like the one thing that I wanted to maintain is I wanted them to move like chickens. So when they moved their heads and stuff, it was like very like jerky and like jolting and like off like off-putting that's and a, that's and, awesome. and luckily he didn't give him feathers thank god thank god i'm, I'm uh, just a man of honor you know mm-hmm. <laughs> man of righteousness hey, man. Mul- muldoon orders the gates raised which a worker does by hand spare no expense my ass uh the cage gets jostled and muldoon locks eyes with the raptor as it tears the worker apart and drags him into the pen for dinner the next the shot day, of his of his body just kind of going up and Perfect. it's like it's just like so otherworldly feeling you know i'll tell you what i fucking hate and I, here's another thing i don't like drop it andy holding his hand in between his arm like that uh. <laughs> like holding his arm as if he's holding his head in a headlock i hated that he was holding his arm that way no like why like i, I just that's another thing that bothered me i don't know why it's so stupid but it like it seems like this doesn't have a great grip strength no joe not at all compared dude. to your <laughs> Dexter's this guy doesn't fingers. have fucking biceps that are gonna completely clamp around this guy's arm. That's like such an easily slippable. When the arm slips through, I'm like, yeah, I'm not surprised by that. Like, yeah. a, a child could have been pulling this man through there, and it w- would have pulled through. Much less a Velociraptor. Steven Andy, Spielberg, fucking get out of here. Let's be honest. At this point, if you saw me get dragged into that pen, how hard would you fight? Versus, like, w- what if I get dragged into that pen too? That's the cost mm. benefit analysis that you're you're weighing in your brain as you're trying to save me as I'm clearly dead. Once the guy got dragged into the pen, I was like, we got to call his his wife and kids. He's There's not nothing die. left like no, on your bottom no, half. No, 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 yeah, no. he's getting torn apart. Even if you manage to pull that out, you're getting half a torso at best. Yeah. Joey. Um, I would just like to start a list uh, so we can figure out what the most gruesome dinosaur related death in this movie is. So we've got some, it, we got some banger ones. Um, we need a name so for I'm the segment. Start. 
dinosaurs. Andy, this is your chomp, thing. Chomp. Dino- <laughs> dinosaur death, which death is the best. Oh, <laughs> okay. no. You know what we're going to workshop like, It's that. like best with a lisp, everybody. Yep, that was yep. good. Uh, the next day, Gennaro, Donald, I'm Donald Gennaro, heads to Mano de Dios Amber Mine, where he you meets with the bad guy like from that. clear and present danger. Uh, we get some exposition about lawsuits the investors are uh, uh, going through, uh, about, about safety inspections on the site. And he goes, if two experts sign off on the island, the investors will sign off. They already have uh, Dr. Ian Malcolm, but he's too sensual, too steamy. <laughs> Too chesty. They want Dr. Alan Grant. But too chesty is what you went with. There's no Joe, let's call this right now. I was gonna wait, but we could just talk about it. Okay. There is no fucking reason why his shirt needs to be open for the entire last half of this movie. Just yeah. throwing it out there. There's no reason for that. That's a that is uh that was not in the script. That is hundred percent a Jeff Goldblum ad lib yeah. for it. And honestly, we should be thankful for it. Yeah, we, we are. should. We he's, are. A, he's a blessing. Uh, but the bad guy from Claire and President Andrew knows that Alan Grant won't go for it. And he goes, why not? He goes, because Grant's a digger. He's like me. He's a digger. And he says that as he pulls a giant rock of amber out with a mosquito in the middle, which is foreshadowing for later. We cut over to Dr. Alan Grant's camp, the Badlands near Snakewater, Montana. Dr. Alan Grant and Dr. Ellie Sattler are using radar to image bones in the ground while a group of tourists walk or watch. They find a velociraptor. Uh, which is a dinosaur I'd never heard of, but quickly became very popular. Grant tells the group of tourists that raptors are birds and Pluto isn't a planet. (sighs) I hate my life. Then we get the best scene (laughs) out of any fucking movie in the 90s ever. This little shit. This little fucking This little piece of shit that dressed exactly like me and kind of looked like me when I was that age. Steps up and he's like, those things don't look scary at all. More like a six foot turkey. (laughs) And let me tell you, Show man, some fucking respect. OK, he just utterly fucking eviscerates this kid. Yeah. He says, the point is you're alive when they start to eat you. So, you know, try and show a little respect. And this kid runs off and just pees his pants. But and also never thinks about dinosaurs again. Also, who's this or, kid there with his parents? Who are his parents? The young couple behind him. Probably. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> It just seems weird that this kid's here. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's like other well, tourists, a of, right? A group of tourists, yeah. All yeah, the people, I guess so. all the people watching that are there. It's 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 confusing because everyone's dressed exactly like Alan. They're all dressed in like those little short shorts and the, and the hiking boots. But a lot of them are supposed to be tourists. I think. I, I, I will say, uh, Nick, the the scene that we get later, where where Grant does eventually fly down, and it's the sequence that you don't you mentioned that you kind of didn't like the take of. Um, I feel like that take is very similar to the direction that was given i don't even know if it felt like an improv moment where he touches the top of the monitor and it, it screens and he's like up oh, and she mm-hmm. and ellie's like oh, he's bad with computers like it. it seems yeah. like such a natural little thing that doesn't service the plot in any way does it like do anything for the story it's just a cute little back and forth and that's how i also kind of read that moment in the room with uh with dr grant or no what um is that yeah, what Hammond. Hammond. Um, yeah, that that's kind of like the same vibe that I got in that room with Hammond, the same vibe where they're above the Velociraptor nest, and that all seems kind of like these are just conversations happening. It just seems like a natural little take, and that's it it's, doesn't seem like overly produced in a way, which I really like. Yeah, it's just that Steven Spielberg's sort of style is overly produced. And so to have scenes mm-hmm. kind of play out a little bit looser always kind of stuck out to me because everything else in this movie is like, like Spielberg, so you guys know, is one of those guys that like plans his shots perfectly. He doesn't shoot what we would traditionally say for coverage. Like he doesn't shoot like a wide and then come in for close-ups. He usually plans the shots like perfectly and he gets exactly what he needs. So this, the, the shot that's coming up next is always kind of weird because it's just a wide shot and then slowly kind of dollies and then we go in for coverage. And it's like, it feels like he just didn't have enough time to really make something special out of this. And the moment kind of like gets lost on me because you're supposed to be very excited for these people, but you know, uh, uh, Sam Neill and Laura Dern just kind of, they kind of overplay it a little bit. And then I'm like, I wish we just had a couple more takes on that. It's just, it's just my own little bias on that one. I just, this team sort of stuck out as a little bit sloppy, but it Nick, doesn't matter. Uh, you said that this kid probably never thought about dinosaurs again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And there is a chance that that is true, but there is also another chance. Joey, you're shaking your head. What are you shaking your head at? There's no way this kid never thought about dinosaurs again. He felt he couldn't sleep every night thinking about the velociraptor ripping open his, ripping stomach, his stomach and his bowels pouring while out. While he's alive. Yeah. yeah. 
There is a very popular fan theory that the boy who gets scared by Alan for scoffing at the Velociraptor in the Utah scene is a young Owen Grady from Jurassic World. No. Owen oh. Grady. Chris Pratt. Get the fuck now, out of here. No, we'll not. see. We'll see. I have a feeling on June 10th, 2022, we might get confirmation one way or another. I hope, I hope not. Let's get another variant going, everybody. Get out of here. Like a non-deadly one, you know what I mean? Yeah, but let's, let's just let's punt that down the road. Yeah. Uh, going through just some fun things, talking about uh, Ellie Sattler and uh, Dr. Grant here, some different actors that were that did screen tests for this movie that did not get the Ooh, part. Oh, I love these stories. Um, me too, and there's some fun ones here. So Kurt Russell and William Hurt were <gasps> oh, both considered oh, for the role awesome. of Dr. Grant, but – were ultimately rejected as their salary requests were too exorbitant. Great word. Um, then for the role of Ian Malcolm, who could it have been instead of Jeff Goldblum? Michael Keaton. Oh. Bruce Campbell. Bruce Campbell. Would have been oh. Johnny Depp. Ted Danson. Steve Gutenberg. The and goot. Michael J. Fox. All oh. screen tested. For the role of Ian Malcolm. <laughs> the Gutnik, that's what you're going with? The Goot. The I think Ted Danson would have had the same like swagger or is like the closest. Back then. Yeah. You know, you just, there's a moment. We're getting where... real close to a three minute and a baby reunion with all of these casting <laughs> options, too, by the way. We should do that and review one of these days. And then uh, the last the last one I got for you here is uh, Ellie Sattler. Uh, people that did screen tests for that included Renee Zellweger, awesome. Kim mm-hmm. Raver, who I don't know who that is. Kim Raver. Kim Raver, I don't know the name. I'll Google it. Kim Heather Raver. Graham. Uh, I would have been good. Mariska Hargitay. Yeah. Yes. From SVU. SVU. Seemed like way too young for that at the time, no? Uh, Nicole Kidman and Lisa Rinna of oh, Real Housewives. Wow. Oh, my Beverly gosh. Fame. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> what great. could have been, everybody? What could have been? I can't anyway, see continue. anyone but Laura Dern in this role. But I, I know, right? Yeah. Yeah. And same with all these characters. I mean, I think Sam Neill have played it so well as well as kind of reserved Alan Grant, kind of kind of mean at some point. But there's a moment when they, they pull off the road, and I didn't write this in the script, in the synopsis, but they pull off the road to go look at the Triceratops poop. And Ian Malcolm takes off. Jeff Goldblum has taken off his jacket, and he's got his sleeves rolled up, and he swaggers up to this dinosaur. Like it is a, a a singles bar, and he's about to hit on everyone in it. <laughs> it is so ridiculous. Like he's so ridiculously over the top in this movie that you can't help but love him. But I digress. Uh, Hammond offers them the deal as they walk into the trailer. He's popping bottles like he's in the VIP room, and he offers them the deal. They come sign off on his park, and he'll fully fund their dig for another three years. And they're like, "I used to have principles, but money <laughs> makes everyone throw those out the window." Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Uh, but you know who this movie could really use, ladies and gentlemen? Newman. That's right. We cut over to South America, uh, and Nedry is meeting with Dotson. And you got, let's stop right here. Because everyone Please. always talks about your Jeff Goldblums, right? They always talk mm-hmm. about your Laura Derns. They always talk about this and that and that. Wayne Knight <laughs> is the best part of this movie by far. Until Samuel L. Jackson gets on screen. Thank you. Thank until you he gets on screen. But up until this point, Wayne Knight, I love this fucking scene because he's like, Dotson, he goes, don't use my name. He goes, Dotson, Dotson, we got Dotson over here. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares. <laughs> and they just, he just laughs his way through this whole thing. And of course, uh, it, we set up at 7 o'clock tomorrow night at the East Dock. And the plan will be in place. I got an 18-minute window. I'm going to steal all these samples for you and stick it in the Barbasol bottle. And for a while, my dad used to have that bottle. And I always thought... Oh. So cool. It'd be so cool. If so like, cool. Yeah. And we got that like I, that iconic like wheeze laugh he does, and and we kind of got are getting more of an angle of what the actual villain is trying to do because it mm-hmm. seems like uh, this guy's a competitor to Hammond and Ingen, which is uh, do we even know they're Ingen yet? They're not Ingen yet. No. Yeah, I don't think so. Right. I think that that gets introduced like I think actually after this whole series. Yeah. Um, I don't know what Newman's plan was going to be here, though, because Nedry is like, I'm going to steal basically millions of dollars worth of research, give it to you. And how is he? Was he planning on going back to work or was he, how was he not on getting down? planning, getting caught? I'd say yeah, that's a good get point. Caught. There's because, yeah. like I said in the beginning of this, there's only three people that work in the control room of this place. <laughs> yeah. So like there's only yeah. three people that could possibly blame. And uh, spoilers, it's not the two guys that are still in the place that you would think of. Right. Because <laughs> there's even that moment where they're like, why would he lock every other door but the. Or why would he lock every exhibit except the Velociraptor uh, bay or whatever? 
And it's like, man, you're looking real sus right now, Nick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, of course, we go over to uh, to the helicopter scene where we get introduced to Doctor E. Malcolm, played by uh uh uh. Well, Jeff uh, <laughs> Malcolm, <laughs> Doctor Ian Malcolm is a chaos vision, <laughs> which I still to this day don't know if it's a real thing. And he likes to wear leather jackets to very humid tropical environments. Uh, oh, but shut up about that, Nick, because we're about to see Isla Nublar for the first time. Better still, Tim, we're about to get hit with one of the greatest themes in movie history. And you know what, Nick? I always talk about uh, iconic music. You guys know how much I love it. You know how much I love a good reprise. You know how much I love just the music coming back for like hero themes and all this stuff. I really, really love Steven Spielberg just allowing John Williams to go ham and then just being like, hey, did you like that moment? Do you want to just do that moment again? Mm -hmm. What about again? Mm -hmm. What about again? What about four times in four minutes? Like the same four minutes. Yeah. There are moments of this movie where they play the theme and they let it just keep going. And I swear to God, we hear the chorus of it like three times. <laughs> yeah. And every time Steven Spielberg's like, all right, I guess we got to ratchet up the visuals for this. Suddenly there's what a are vocalist. We keep showing that? Dude, it is so damn good every time. If you go back and watch this scene, this because it, it, it keeps reprising, it keeps going back over and over again as the helicopter's landing. And I swear to God, at one point, the helicopter just starts at the beginning again and goes yeah, all the way down like, again. And we're going like, back up again. <laughs> yeah. And, and the editor's like, maybe we can get away with it one more time. And Steven Spielberg is like, how about four more times? This is the greatest theme ever fucking laid down on celluloid. It's just funny because this is, there's two themes in this movie there's this, and then there's the softer theme that comes in later, like the more delicate theme. Both are just absolute bangers. Uh, of course. Two Jeeps pull up. Also, while we're talking about the music real quick, I just want to sure. give a shout out to something that I've never really cared about, but I thought was done really well in this. Like, oh, obviously the iconic themes are so great, but this movie starts off with like a dope ass synth that I, I didn't expect. And it kind of mm. comes throughout the movie, especially for a lot of the more like velociraptor -y stuff. And just shout out to John Williams getting nasty on the keys. Oh, yeah. Getting nasty on the keys, bro, bro. Um, um, something else that I noticed for the first time in this helicopter scene that I hadn't really realized before is the other guy that's in the thing. Is he a lawyer? I never remember what. Yeah, he yeah he's a lawyer. Yeah. I he's love the one that's like pushing the hardest against this thing opening. And that's why yeah. when suddenly everybody's being like, Hammond, this is a bad idea. Hammond's like, everybody's against me except the lawyer. What the fuck's going on here? You know? Yeah, I just love that he is wearing a suit on top, but shorts. <laughs> and I feel like that just paints like a really good Joey. picture of him not <laughs> fitting it. I didn't realize he was wearing it in the helicopter. Joey, for yes. the longest time, I didn't know he was wearing shorts. I legitimately thought he was taking a shit on the toilet <laughs> when he gets eaten. Because I saw his bare legs. And oh I my was gosh. Like, is he shitting? Like, did he stop? So did shit? I. No, I did he's too. Just, he's just sitting on the toilet wearing <laughs> shorts. But that it looks like he is dropped. Very funny. He's got those big puffy socks on that people wear when they wear hiking boots. Oh my mm -hmm. God. Isn't that so funny? That's, That's like fucking about my brain right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. He wasn't pooping. He literally just was just hiding out and sitting on the toilet. But because his legs are bare, you think he's just dropping a deucer. You think that, that is... he tried to escape from the T Rex because he really had to poop? That That's what the, I thought when I was a kid. I was like, process. That's a... I mean, I guess when you got to remember how like sometimes Greg, it will, like a mist will hit him in the supermarket and he'll just shit his pants. <laughs> It's very similar well, to that. I mean, I think it was always supposed to look like that because he has the newspaper up in front of him, right? Or no. am I just Mandela Are we affecting totally all this shit? Shit? Like, no, this Eddie, I'm right there with you. Was there not a newspaper? No, there's not a newspaper. He's well, just Jeff Gold shit. Jeff Goldblum gets covered with the newspaper. No, he gets covered with the hay from the side oh, of the fucking shit. The building. <laughs> so funny. I just saw this. It's like a bamboo. Yeah. Isn't that weird? Yeah, he gets the, he gets he gets pushed through the wall, and the wall is made of like that thick like kind of bamboo, uh, like, like, like you know, ish. palm tree kind of stuff, and it just kind yeah, of yeah. You're on. right, you're right, you're right. Isn't that funny though? What a weird what the world hell! World. Oh my god! So like, I never, as a kid, thought like, oh, he's shitting. It, I thought it was just meant to look that way, right? Look at, it, this, look at what Tim just put through Slack. Like, that's yeah. what this looks like. It looks like he's dropping a deuce because it, like, it looks like his shirt is just over his leg, but it's not. They're shorts. A little dookie. Yeah. If you could bring up uh, at, at like 53 seconds, please, on the clip I just sent you. I, uh, just like Andy, just watched this movie a couple days ago, and I remember this scene looking extremely different than it actually is right now. Oh, my God. He's wearing shorts. What in the fuck? See? <laughs> Isn't that so funny? That's wild. Man. But, we're, but we're not I, there I yet. Know. 
uh, two Jeeps pull up with the Jurassic Park logo on them, which, if I'm not mistaken, Tim, is the same one they use for the logo of this film. Oh, shit. That is a fun fact. It goes up in most people's eyes and ears. but It's very subtle. Viewers. It's very subtle because you only see this logo 500 times. Mm-hmm. But I always, I always kind of loved that they were like the logo of the movie they're just going to use in the film. I thought that it's, was such I a mean, great it's... meta commentary on like – fuck it, this whole thing's just a one big commodity and you're going to buy this logo on fucking yeah. freaking drinks for the rest of your life. Well, that was the thing I was saying earlier as a fact. Mm-hmm. I, I think I glossed over this a bit, but at the time they made licensing deals with over 100 companies, which was a record. Like, it was more than Star Wars. Like, we we obviously think about Star Wars being legitimately everywhere, but like, up until they re-released the original trilogy in the 90s and they had all those Taco Bell partnerships and like they went super, super hard. Like Pepsi, Jurassic yeah. Park, what, yeah, all the Pepsi stuff. Jurassic Park was like, yo, it's everywhere. And you can even just tell from watching the, the movie, like in the same way like Transformers is just a toy commercial, uh, even the cartoon. Like with this, there's mul- there's different colored Jeeps. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like they mm-hmm. knew they're like, you oh, got to get them all, man. Yeah. They know. And it's still exciting, like whenever you see them in the wild on rare occasion, it's like, ah, it's the Jeep. Like, yeah, I feel like, like they like should cooler, commercially make them. <laughs> it's cooler to me than like what when Greg sees a Ghostbuster, uh, yeah. or, or like a, uh, or like a, um, the DeLorean or some shit. Like when mm-hmm. I see the Jurassic Park Jeep, it's the coolest moment ever in my life, you know. So uh, should we all get Jeeps and get them custom painted? I think so. Yeah, we should, we should. Okay. Uh, they head to headquarters, to the head, or up to the, the lodge, I guess, but Hammond makes them stop when he spots something in the horizon. Dr. Alan Grant sees it first, but Ellie is too busy looking at a leaf, so he turns her head for her, and then we get it. The second best, if not tied for the first best movie theme ever made, uh, which is the softer, more ballad version of the theme. Uh, and man, this scene, is, this scene is the best scene. I think this is the scene in the movie that sticks out to me. And this and the T-Rex scene, I think, are the iconic moments of this film. Uh, they see... I'm going to call them bronchiosauruses, but I know that that's not what they're called anymore. What are they called, Kevin? What are these things called? It's a brachiosaurus. Brachiosaurus, is that what they are? Yeah. They're not brontosauruses anymore? No, they're brachiosauruses now. They ch- they changed our whole channel. No, bro- no, brachiosauruses have this sort of the like... Little, oh, they have the little, tall, the little fin. The tall thing in the middle of fin. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I don't no, remember, the- recall whether these are brachiosauruses or brontosauruses, but I know that... That's like one of the main differences. Oh, okay. So I was just a dumb kid. I thought they were the same thing and they were changing it up on me. Uh, <laughs> they see that and everyone is taken aback. And of course, Donald uh, uh, Gennaro just sees dollar signs. Grant wants to know how fast they are. And Hammond tells him that they, they, they clocked the T-Rex at 30 miles per hour. And Grant faints, presumably yeah, because a keeping T-Rex. a T-Rex on an island that small is the worst idea anyone's ever come up with. I'm sure that won't come back to bite us in the ass in the end. Welcome, he says, to Jurassic Park. And it's a dope ass so moment. Good. Uh, mm. Then Hammond takes the team out to the lodge and shows them a presentation about cloning and the miracle of DNA, which they got from blood in the mosquitoes they found in ancient amber. Uh, and he I just want to, real quick, I want to say uh, that a lot of this movie was shot in Hawaii, and a lot of these areas are just are real places in Hawaii. And uh, when I went to Hawaii for my friend's wedding a couple of years back, we were driving to get somewhere, and I knew that the Jurassic Park stuff was somewhere, but I didn't know where. I knew it was on the island we were on. So I was just kind of looking out, like hoping it would happen, and it happened. And I just looked outside the car. I'm like, oh, my God. And I was like, stop playing random music. Hold on, guys. And I I had to pull it up. And I pulled up the Jurassic Park theme. And it was the greatest moment of my life. (laughs) Um, You can actually take a Jurassic Park tour when you go to that island. If you ever go back to that, they'll they'll show you all the parts of the place the movie was taken, which is cool. Uh, Any gaps in the DNA sequence, of course, are plugged up with Frog's DNA. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, Grant, Malcolm, and Ellie decide to go off the ride prematurely and head into the lab to check out what the heck's going on. Uh, we see a little baby dinosaur. Shout out to, to the little DNA guy. Dude, so not no DNA. Major <laughs> shout out, man. So yeah. damn cool. And then I love, and I love while they're in that Hammond being like, and of course we're going to have more epic music right here. Yeah, it's a boom, 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 boom. But like, it's like, <laughs> he's totally seeing the vision of it. He's like, this is just kind of like the beta version of what you're seeing right now. Well, it's, and it's funny. Cause like they really nail the fact that the park is like in beta testing, right? Even he doesn't know his lines. And, and the, I love the part where ha- the Hammond on screen starts talking and throws to him. And then he goes, oh, so I have my lines here. And before he can get his next line out, the Hammond on the film just keeps going. Yeah. he just hasn't quite got the timing of that yet. Mm-hmm. It's, I, I thought that was always All a cool those little, little touches, touch. man. Yeah. Uh, they go into the lab, of course, and they see a little baby being born. And it is a velociraptor. Uh, Hammond insists on being present for the birth of every creature on the island. Malcolm asks about the animal. He's like, what about the animals born in the wild? And Dr. Wu, play, uh, Dr. Wu played by the venerable uh, B.D. Wong, who I freaking love in this movie and just will – 
never forgive them for what they did in his character in the, in the following movies. Uh, tells him that all dinosaurs on the island are female, but Malcolm takes uh, takes him to school. Uh, he says his his great long diatribe, which I wanted to write down, but I didn't. But of course, it ends with the line, "Life uh, finds a way." Dude, I mean, this whole thing, like the the D- Mr. DNA cartoon, the way that it's all handled, leading into this, talking about the female uh, situation. I am just so blown away at how it comes across as effortless, but it's obvious it was the most effort ever into making exposition fun and setting up the rules and kind of like slapping our dumbass faces, just being like, stop, don't stop asking questions. Stop trying to be smarter than us. No, (laughs) here are the fucking rules of how this dinosaur park is going to work. And you're just going to believe it. And because of that, because they do a good job, you just believe it. You know, yeah, mm-hmm. and then I, I do, yeah. During that sort of back and forth, Nick, I think we have that, that really cool moment where BD Wong is like, "So you're saying that the the, the females will eventually uh, mate with each other and reproduce?" And and yeah, uh, Ian Malcolm's just like, "No, I'm saying that life will find a way." It's just like the coolest concept ever, man. He has. Let me see if I can read this because I just pulled it up. Uh, Dr. Ian says, but again, how do you know all, uh, they're all female? Does somebody go out into the park and pull up the dinosaur skirts? And what Dr. Wu goes, we control their chromosomes. It's really not that difficult. All vertebrae embryos are inherently female, yada, yada. And he goes, she says, you deny them the hormone. And Dr. Ian Malcolm says, John, the kind of control you're attempting simply is it's not possible. If there's one thing the history of evolution has taught us, it's that life will not be contained. Life breaks free. It expands to new territories and crashes through barriers painfully, even dangerously. But, uh... Well, there uh, and there it is. And then Hammond's looking at him, like trying to be the mediator of this conversation. And goes, there it is. <laughs> there <laughs> he it repeats is. the same line. It's so great. <laughs> it's, it's so, so good. great. And so like, good. honestly, shout out to Jeff Goldblum for that performance, because I feel like that could have gotten so like heavy and muddled. But like the conviction with which he says it and his performance and like, it's so good. And like, you really feel like he believes it and like, is so, like trying to explain it to them really hard. Oh, and again, no. if done, if, if this were a horror movie, right, uh, Dr. Wu and Hammond would be these like evil characters that would like try and push him back down. But they like listen to him. They're just, this is like a legit just academic debate on whether mm-hmm. or not these people should be doing these things. And even when I was watching when I was a kid, I was like, I don't see anyone here as being necessarily 100 percent wrong. But this maybe should be a cautionary tale for DNA splicing going forward, unless they can make you taller and make your hair thicker, in which case sign me the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe learn. How I to feel dunk. like. Oh my gosh. I feel like um, when you were talking earlier about how you don't think that Hammond is the like true villain of this, I think the way that you see him uh, like coaxing these raptors through breaking out of the Mm -hmm. their shells and stuff like that shows like the true care and like the humanity side of him where he's like no this is just something that I'm like genuinely passionate about and excited about that like versus if he just like didn't care about any of that and was only trying to get the money you see that there's absolutely like he's not trying to exploit any of this. He's he's deaf, and that's why he's a redeemable I mean, he character. Is, but, and that's you know. well, he is, but <laughs> but he's doing it out of love and out of the spirit of innovation, right? He yeah. he has that great line later where he talks about the first thing he ever did was a flea circus, and he goes, "That was an illusion. This was supposed to be not an illusion. This I just wanted to legitimately like." He was just in love with the idea of legitimately showing people something they'd never seen before, and you can't not, you can't hate that character. You can feel pity for them. You can think, "Hey, you were wrong. Yeah. You did this bad thing," but he did a bad thing for. All pretty much altruistic reasons. Um, mm-hmm. even, and, you know, we have the scene later where he's talking about the money, too. He's like, I don't want this to be for rich people, which we already brought up. Um, anyway, for the love of the game. Along, for the love of the game. Uh, let's see. Grant realizes that they're holding, uh, they're holding a baby raptor and freaks out. Hammond takes them to the raptor cage, which seems very, very small, very dense, and really not high enough. I'll just throw that out there. If you're building a <laughs> raptor cage, maybe make it the size of a football field with no plants in it so you can see the raptors. You know, like they can't get out. I feel like it needs a lid. I feel like we're missing a lid. A lid would go a long way. It's also one of those, uh, right before that, it's one of those sort of line delivery moments I'll remember for the rest of time. And it's such a small, weird thing. Just like I'll always remember the teacher in Spider Man 1 with Toby McGuire when he walks up to him and he goes, You "You guys have been to, I kid you not. (laughs) Yeah, that weird guy. Uh, (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Uh, I remember Grant looking at this, holding the, and, and going, Brad Raptors, yeah, and BD Wong going, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he does like a weird like <laughs> he yeah. kind of like looks up slowly and goes, like a weird kind of evil nod. It's very very bizarre. It's, I, I suggest everybody go watch it because it's like 
I feel in that moment, BD Wong is set up to be the villain that he eventually becomes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe. Uh, Grant watches them feed the raptors with a live cow, and it's terrifying. And at this point, if this were, if I were making this movie, you would just see like if I was if I was Grant in this, you would just see a heart a helicopter to me going leave. right back to the helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> 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 End of movie. I'm not staying around for this. Uh, Muldoon echoes my sen- my sentiment. He comes in and says they should all be destroyed. Uh, they're super fast, super smart, and can solve problems. Also, lovely singing voices, the lot of them. Uh, they head to lunch, and Donald wants to sell tickets for $10,000, but Hammond rebuffs him and says, this park isn't just for the rich. It's going to be for everyone. And no, then Malcolm but, slant. Uh, I, I, I also just want to point out that in that conversation, that, that very important line of dialogue of how smart they are and how the pack leader of these Velociraptors was making the other raptors test out the electrified fence Mm -hmm. and they were never testing out the same spot at once because and just having that moment of like setting up the horror for later of him going they remember Mm -hmm. and it's like god damn that is so fucking scary dude (laughs) like and we get get the line later too where it's like we're safe for now unless unless velociraptors figure out how to open doors and then you see one of them fucking opening the door yeah. like, oh god, god. It's honestly so the most good. terrifying scene of the entire thing it's like oh you know how to open doors dear yeah. god dear god they're smart uh and then we get the great the great scene where they're uh they're eating dinner um and uh you know malcolm just lays it down again he says your scientists were so preoccupied with whether they could they didn't stop to think if they should but then hammond fires back uh, with some con- condor gibberish, and then he says, uh, he's, "He says dinosaurs had their shot, and nature selected them for extinction." Which um, I don't like. I don't like. I don't like that. That's not nature. That's a galactic fucking <laughs> uh, like uh, anomaly. Like a me- like if the world heated up for no reason, and then all the dinosaurs died, sure. But like the idea of a fucking asteroid a coming yeah. out of nowhere, like that's a that's a weird not nature thing to me yeah, all right but bring it, the I, dinosaurs yeah. back everybody it's a good idea that's like an outlier exactly joe it's a weird anomaly but uh i think his point was that dinosaurs never existed with humans and we're probably not meant to exist together ever uh for obvious reasons that we'll see in the next few movies but hammond tries to I agree uh, to disagree you know and fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> what are you again a fundamentalist uh hammond tries to enlist you you realize creationists don't believe in dinosaurs they think that they're fake no there's like a there's a branch of creationists i remember is on some document there's some branch of creationism that believe that dinosaurs and humans lived together like that their justification for finding dinosaur bones was Uh like oh well yeah they existed six thousand years ago with jesus christ and like they all did stuff together Mm mm-hmm and it's like, no, but carbon dating shows that these things are like 65, 70 million years old or whatever. They're like, nah, man, agree, that's disagree. crazy. <laughs> that's a great. Uh, let's see. Hammond tries to levy Grant for help with this argument, but he lays it down. He says dinosaurs are man, two species separated by, separated by 65 million years of evolution have just been suddenly thrown back into the mix with each other. How could we possibly have the slightest idea what to expect? I mean, for all we know, Donald might get eaten by a T-Rex while shitting on the John. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Hammond's grandkids show up, and for some reason, I know that guys listen. I get it. Okay, no, I'm obsessed you don't. with hair in movies. I understand it. I know it's a problem. I'm talking to my therapist about it. But why? Oh, why did they dye these two kids' hair to look exactly the same? It's fucking weird. They're creepy little kids getting Wait, out what? of the movies. If what you, you look at their hair, they're the exact same shade. The little kid, the two kids, mm-hmm. they dyed their hair to be like a weird strawberry blonde. And it doesn't look like a natural color that anyone's hair should be. And it looks really fucking weird on kids. It the might kids be a are wig. redhead. I don't know. I love Nick so much. No, the kids the are redhead. Blonde. Yeah, the, the girl, kids are redhead. They're the exact same. Look at <laughs> the exact same. Look at it. Look at it. On, in no, the movie, they look exactly the same. They, died, they, they made their hair look close to the same. The kids are redhead, and he stays a redhead. And you'll know this from the movie Social Network. He's one of the guys uh, with uh, Jesse Eisenberg and Zuckerberg's crew trying to make Facebook. Look at he's a redhead his whole life. Look at right, you Google them right next to each other, practically the same color hair. Sure, <laughs> practically. sure. Looking at it now, looking at it now, Lex very blonde kid, very red. But we'll just <laughs> we'll just move on. We'll just move on from that. Maybe it's my monitor. I'll check. check, check oh, Tim, come over and check my settings on my monitor. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you, you said earlier, Nick, that you that you didn't like the kids. I I, I like the kids in this. Me too. I, 
I, I thought that they were like pretty funny. And maybe it's because I was a kid and I was named Timmy, so there was a lot of like, you oh, know, yeah. like my bro, his bro type mm-hmm. thing. Can you guys imagine the amount of times at a playground I go on a play structure and hold things to go like, <laughs> yeah. oh my like, god, yeah. jump off? Yeah, that was I like mean, that Tim, was my like, even... party trick. Growing up, not even named Tim, I did that yeah. shit. <laughs> like, yeah. um, no, but yeah, I, I agree with you, Tim. I like the kids, and even watching them, uh, even watching this movie last night, I I like that they are kind of intentionally supposed to be annoying to Dr. Grant. And I know I'm, I may be, the, may be the only one who really kind of enjoys that storyline with Sattler and Grant, kind of like, Hey, let's 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 have kids in the future because I well, I, I find it endearing. I find it adorable. There's that moment where they get off the jeep and she like tries to hold his hand and he's just like, "What the fuck?" And it cuts to and that they're walking by and it cuts to Sadler. She kind of smiles. She sticks her tongue out like it's so cute, man. I love. She's like, it. oh, she loves you. <laughs> this yeah. is very funny. It's weird though because watching this movie when I watched this movie the first time until like an hour in when they're in the car and Malcolm asks if, she, if they're together, I had no idea if they were just coworkers or actually together. Was See, that, am I, I just had, crazy in thinking that? No, you're not crazy. I don't think they do a good job with it. I think it is because of the oddness of some of their scenes together and the way yeah. that they speak to each other. I'm on the opposite side of you, but I did think it was weird where I was like, Ian Malcolm, they're clearly together like right. keep it in your fucking pants gold bloom yeah. you know what i mean so it's like i think that something along the lines of these characters is just it's a little bit weird yeah mm. i mean it's i think it's purposeful to like uh, i think having that line of ian malcolm even asking i think he's maybe supposed to be a part of the audience in that moment to kind of be like hey you're not weird for thinking are they together or are they not when we're having one of the main characters ask the same question because they aren't like overly romantic by any no, means. No, they don't even um, touch each other. They don't touch yeah. each other for the, they hug each other one time when the dig gets funded, but they hug each other like coworkers would hug each other if they found out yeah. they weren't getting fired. But, right? like but they, there's also, they got promoted. But I, I think I, I, there's that really awesome line that happens really quickly where he's like, Dr. Grant talks about kids and, uh, or Hammond talks about kids and Dr. Grant says, what are those? But he was asking, an, he was asking, what are the those other things you just mentioned? And Ellie uh, Sattler goes, "Oh, kids are just really small adults." Yeah, <laughs> like to kind line. of like give him a jab, like, "Yeah, we we, we know you don't like kids, you know." And so yeah. that I think there are, are enough little hints fed to the audience throughout the way to let you know that they are together. But um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, um, it's, I actually it really those... liked it, just Did because I, in the terms of like. I like that they didn't pigeonhole Ellie Sattler as just the girlfriend. Mm -hmm. Like she actually got to be like a full fledged character without, because I feel like so often the female lead, like in those situations, yeah, she would have been the damsel in distress. Very one dimensional and stuff like that. And she got to actually have like character development and like a little bit more depth than I think if they would have focused on their relationship more. And they even have that line later, right? Where it is like a, it is a, an acknowledgement about how well written the Ellie character <clears throat> is. Where Hammond goes, "I should be going to do this thing because, well, you know." And she's like, "We can have a conversation about like your misogyny later. Like, mm-hmm. I'll just, I'll just go do this because it needs to get done." One could also argue that Ellie is the only person in this movie that actually does something to like <laughs> help them get off this fucking island, right? Everyone else yeah. is like. Because Sam Neill saves the kids, I guess you could argue this and stuff. But nobody really like. <laughs> He's kind of occupied. Yeah, and who, but, Jeff but Goldblum like has to have his charge. chest out. You know? Yeah, Jeff Goldblum's like, I got to lay down for the last 45 minutes. Man, they sideline him so fast in this. I know. <laughs> this is crazy. Anyway. Uh, cool. But he's yeah. also like not. <laughs> like he's like, Captain Marvel, Tim. <laughs> It's too OP. <laughs> it is what it is. Thanos would have been like, dead. Like, he's off world. <laughs> off world. Oh my That's gosh. so funny. But it, like, at least uh Sattler and Grant like are used to being on these digs and have all these things like he doesn't have like a lot of practical skill I think to get what, them the off of the station? island Other yeah than tell them compared that to everybody else to, shit, to point out the obvious of like I was right yeah he has no other reason to be there um but we move on they head to the remote control cars to take the tour and Grant gets stuck in the car with the stinky kids his word not mine uh, Muldoon tracks an incoming storm while Samuel L. Jackson on screen for the first SLJ, time. SLJ, baby. SLJ, who could forget? A fucking heater. 
There is not one. He is so cool in this movie, and it makes me want to smoke so bad, Tim. (laughs) Can you even imagine a a world right now where Nick Fury comes on screen smoking a dart? Just it's not going to happen anymore. But he's just everyone's so sweaty, and he's and it's funny because like so cool. He's a fucking nerd in this movie. Like I don't think he's supposed to be cool, but you just can't. You can't have SLJ doing anything close yeah. to smoking a cigarette and not just being the dopest looking dude in the <laughs> fucking world man you, uh go for it no you go for it i was just gonna say uh, a fun thing that i noticed in this uh, was uh they talk about future attractions like they're in a room or when they meet slj around here mm-hmm. and if you look at the screen there's like a bunch of like future attractions for the park and uh, a couple of them are what we end up seeing in jurassic world did you notice yeah. that oh cool. like one of them cool. was that big like pool thing the that, big tank uh, the bit, the yeah, big, the big tank. I was like, oh, shit, that's that's kind of fun. That's really, really cool. Uh, of course, Samuel L. Jackson gets to say the fun line here that I believe made it into the trailers because hold on to your butts. And we uh, we start the tour. Uh, we learn this a little is, bit about I want to talk about something real quick. Sure. Tim talked about how, like, iconic this movie is. And, like, if you've ever existed on the internet and have somehow never seen Jurassic Park, it, it's wild how many moments during the movie, including this one, you'd be like, oh, that's where this came from. And like, mm-hmm. this movie has to have like a, an incredibly high percentage of those moments compared to like, I don't, I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head other than like the office where it's like gift so much that you would see things that you didn't mm-hmm. necessarily understand. Oh yeah. Hold on to your butts. Just like something I say all the fucking time. <laughs> like, yeah. And so it's just like, I think it was by the time I got to this point that I was like, man, this is just so quotable and like things that I'm sure there's a ton of people that have, especially like as we get to younger generations who have mm-hmm. maybe not seen this, but like just know it because I mean, it's pop culture on. endemically. How many times have you seen the, the slow zoom in on Jeff Goldblum while he's lying there like freaking like, like he's just a <laughs> sex symbol with his shirt open. That's the best. Um, we learn a little bit about Kevin's favorite dinosaur, the Dilophosaurus, which spits venom at its prey, causing blindness and eventually paralyzes it. But we don't get to see it, unfortunately. And this is the first time that maybe some stuff wasn't so thought out on this tour. Uh, it was so great, right? Like, how dope is it that they get on this tour and it's like the first exhibit, it's not there. And it's like that it works, again, on two levels where there's the one side of it of like, okay is this a good idea i don't know like the the park seems kind of like iffy but then there's the other side of this is terrifying Mm -hmm. (laughs) that that we don't have eyes on this thing especially because uh the scene when we get the the raptor cage and the with the cows being lowered into it one thing i loved that steven spielberg did was have the camera switch between them looking out at it and the camera in the raptor cage and the sound effects change from hearing like the <laughs> of them like killing the cow to them being inside it. And it is just a cacophony of disastrous like horror movie shit going on. And like to know that that's what's going on in these different exhibits and then to be driving by this exhibit and then explain the horrible death that these things can allow and mm-hmm. then it not being there. I just think is like such a like uh, it's perfect. It's just absolutely perfectly paced. Uh, Hammond gives Nedry some shit because he's messy and tries to run the entire park from his multi-monitor setup at his desk. And then they argue about money. Uh, then Muldoon quits, uh, quiets them down because they're approaching the T-Rex area. And they talk about man eating God or something weird like that. What, then, what's the, uh, what, what's, what are they, what's the word that they call it? The T-Rex Bay? Is it? No, I don't know. I, I didn't write it down. There's like a word that, that that scientist in particular keeps on mentioning that I really liked. Mm-hmm. But yeah, then we get the, uh, uh, uh god creates man man fucking man creates dinosaur dinosaur eats man and then i think ellie goes uh and then women, women uh away. yeah yeah dinosaur yeah. eats man women inherit the earth yeah that's great mm-hmm. uh, laura dern great just great this phenomenal in this yeah. she's movie. so good uh then she's they good in everything up, you know she is good, like, i don't understand everything. people that don't like laura dern well there's some stuff. There's some stuff. We're not, we're not <laughs> going to bring that. We're not going to bring that energy into this. Uh, then they raise a goat up from the ground, but the T Rex never shows up, and it's so boring. The goat himself even just lays down and goes to sleep. Malcolm, of course, takes the opportunity to just absolutely dunk on him, and he looks up into the little camera and goes, "Now, eventually, you plan on having <laughs> dinosaurs on your dinosaur tour, right?" To which Ham replies, "I really hate that guy." Then this is the <laughs> this is the gift that always comes to my mind whenever Nick does anything, and mm-hmm. I think of Hammond saying. 
I really hate that man. <laughs> like, <laughs> that is exactly what I think about. <laughs> I'm glad I can evoke that kind of emotion. Uh, let's see. They come across a triceratops uh, whose poops more than my brother, and Ellie pops a boil on its tongue. Uh, Grant oh, listens so to its gross. breathing, and it's just a great magical little scene. Uh, Ellie realizes that there's some West, West Indian lilac that it might be getting into that might be causing it to have these uh, this this illness. Uh, and she asks to root through the its poop, and she kind of gets it all over her legs. And I'm like, ooh, that's your Okay, we're wearing shorts and all you do. Like, if you're going to jump into a pile of poop that big, give me a full suit. I don't want to just have a little arm poop things. Oh, Chad called it out the paddock. Mm. That's, That's, a paddock. It. That's a cool name. Quiet. We're reaching the, the Tyrannosaurus Rex paddock. So cool. Um, this is the scene Joey was talking about where uh, Lex falls down and then Grant helps her up and she holds his hand. And he, can't, he can't get rid of it. <laughs> and he's, it's the first time it kind of, he kind of softens to the kids. Um, and then back at the control center, they pull the plug on the tour and return back, uh, return them back to the garage because the, the 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 storm is coming in. Uh, out of time, Nedry sets his plan in place as the storm rolls in with fury. Uh, Ray, played by Samuel Jackson, lights another dart and notices that the security systems are shut down. Nedry raids the bio lab and heads out uh, while the cars get stuck on the tracks. Uh, fences start to fail all over the park. Uh, in his Absolutely case. fucking horrifying. Yeah, Absolutely. Is, I also where, love when Nedry is like explaining like, oh. I'm going to go get something, but like, the, like it's just the word vomit of it of, yeah. I need to be cool, but I need to explain what's happening, but I need to pretend like I'm just going to get We're something. And it's just like, We're snack. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like word vomit. I'm like, oh, that's Man. so relatable. And I feel oh. like he sells it so well. I'll tell you what, he hits on, a, he hits on something that young Nick never understood until he said it. He goes, I'm going to go to the vending machine. Do you guys want anything from the vending machines? I had a lot of sugary things. And right now I want something, I need something salty to counter. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> Fucking so a, true, man. bro. I was like, that's so true. <laughs> I just had a bag of M and M's. Maybe I go for the hot fries after. Yeah, this, exactly. You know? It's yeah. so funny. Uh, again, shout out to Wayne Knight. Uh, of course, in his haste uh, to make it to the East Dock, he he skids out of control and slams into the sign, which is pointing the direction. And, I, and I, that that part's the scariest thing, where he like twirls it and it just keeps it goes around. He's like, shit, I don't know how, where to go now. Uh, Timmy finds us at night vision goggles and everyone hears a thud in the distance that shakes those little glasses of water they give you at cocktail parties, which never actually hydrate you. Now, fun <laughs> fact about this one, Tim, do you have this written down at all? Mm -mm. In order to get the perfect put like a uh, ripple of water, they had to put a gigantic like wire underneath the, the, the dashboard and like pluck it. So that it would oh. resonate, it would resonate. Oh, in the sound like a giant they kept, yeah, they tried to like, they tried a bunch of things apparently, like like pounding on the dashboard and all that stuff, but it didn't look right. It needed to be, it needed to be a concussion coming up from the ground, and so they had. I guess they did it that way, which is crazy. wow. Yeah, I mean, so here's the thing: like this movie, we can say iconic a bazillion times, and we're going to be right because every single thing is. And I feel like every single scene, we're like, this is the scene of the movie. This is the scene of the movie. But like real talk, this is the scene of the movie. This is and like this entire entire bit is so good at just making you believe, scaring the hell out of you. Like it, the the levels of it ratcheting up. To the point of this thing being terrifying, them being separated, the Jeep falling over the thing. Before it falls over the thing, it's on top of them, and they're now about to drown in mud. That's it's horrifying. so creative and so good at just constantly adding new levels of threat um, to these, these characters that like you just don't want to die. And it's like there there's so many different things that can kill them in a Final Destination type mm -hmm. situation, except one of the things is a fucking dinosaur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right. Tim, and this is another one of those great moments where I think this scene works so well because of the gigantic animatronic T Rex that they made. Um, because you don't see too much CG in this. I think a lot of this was just a big ass fucking puppet they made. But that that thing slamming through the top glass of the car and the kids having to stop it, like Kevin did that one time where he tried to fix Paula's sunroof. Like yeah. all that stuff <laughs> is so terrifying. This whole scene plays out so beautifully, and of course, yeah, we, ends with Nick, it was just like that. Like a <laughs> hundred just like that. <laughs> We get this. We get the CG of the Tyrannosaurus Rex finally breaking through the fence, and it sort of steps in in the whole sequence where Grant is trying to like lead it with the flare or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but all of that just looks so good, and I think a lot of it is because it was the 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 choice to shoot it at night, the choice to shoot it in the rain. So some of it is obscured mm -hmm. a little bit. But yeah, to this day, I still think that like obviously the CG still holds up super well. I think there's a couple sequences that like upon uh, 70th watching or whatever with these uhd versions of them mm -hmm. uh I, I think in that, particular yeah. the 
the close-up shot of the ground looking up when they first see the Brachiosaurus in that intro sequence. Um, you can see the texture work on the dinosaurs just like is not quite up to snuff the That's way you, you thought it was. Yeah, but still, like, I, I think just the setting and the way that they look so lived in that world and mm -hmm. they don't add in any way ever look like they're kind of floating in some fake area. Uh, it's still incredibly impressive for that era, especially. There's, There's a like corridor digital um who if you guys aren't familiar with you should get familiar on youtube incredibly talented vfx artist uh they do a series where they challenge each other each other to like fun vfx battles and stuff and one of the battles was remaking this scene with modern technology and uh it's a 25 minute video that came out uh last november just youtube re remade the jurassic park t-rex uh it is one of the most fascinating videos i've ever seen because they break down every element of jurassic park like they watch it and they're like oh they probably did this they definitely did this i heard in an interview they did that and they're like this is how we're gonna do it with modern stuff and then you see what they make and it's like it's just so incredible that's cool incredibly that's so impressive. fun um there's another little fact here that i think was in the movie that made us the movies that made us where they, they said they had a hell of a time with the animatronic t-rex because they didn't account for the rain and apparently when you you pour rain on uh something that's predominantly made of foam it sucks up the foam and makes it like four times heavier. And so oh, they just like, they had, yeah, they were like, oh, this is a problem we didn't think of. It's just like, yeah. It's, also, uh, it's, it's didn't happens. all the electronics get wet? And oh, because yeah. of that, it would kind of randomly move on its own. Yeah. Which Kathleen Kennedy apparently. says the T-Rex went into the heebie-jeebies sometimes, scared the crap out of us. It would get wet when we were like eating lunch and all of a sudden the T-Rex would come alive. At first we didn't know what was happening and then we realized it was the rain. You'd hear people just start screaming. It was terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Fuck That's so no, man. Dope. That's cool. so, so the, um, the roar of uh, the T-Rex is obviously an iconic sound effect. Do you guys know or want to guess? what combination of sound effects you this is have a line i know somewhere. this yeah i've so, seen this so many fucking times i got a list of five animals that they okay. have here so we're guessing go for it lion. i want to say it's something weird like a duck or a goose you're very close joe not one of those not a lion either tiger i'll give you tiger tiger and lion same thing yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um elephant elephant boom two out of yeah. five was it a goose? Duck, duck, no, goose. It was duck, no, but and goose were not very chicken? similar. Was it a chicken? Very, very a similar. Rooster? A, a, little, a little more chilly. A penguin. A penguin. A wow. penguin. Wow. I don't think I knew that penguins made noises. Like, I don't think oh, I could terrifying. pinpoint that. Let me tell you something right now, Joe. You oh, they're that. terrifying, says Nick. If you hear, <laughs> if you hear a penguin make that noise, you better kiss your ass penguin. goodbye. You're you, yeah, dead. you better call your parents and say, I love you. I'll miss you. Oh, Final. I okay, I have heard this. Final two, dog and uh -huh. alligator. What kind of dog? Schnauzer? It just says dog. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, this whole scene plays out great. Uh, the, the kids go over the, there's a, the beat where the, they have to climb down the the wire, the, 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 the car goes over the thing. De Niro gets eaten. Dr. Malcolm gets smashed with the wall and all hell breaks loose. Uh, Hammond, uh, let's see, uh, uh, Grant, Hammond asks Muldoon to go get his grandchildren. And Ellie decides to ride shotgun, no pun intended, while Ray tells the old man they're screwed without Nedry, who just got stuck in the mud. He spots uh, the road that leading to the East Dock and tries to use the cable winch on the, uh, the front of the Jeep, but falls uh, and loses his glasses. But thankfully, a cute little Dilaposaurus finds it. And he goes, oh, you're not so bad. Maybe I'll give you a candy bar or something. Just wait. Just wait. Then he heads back to the car. And the Dilo chases after him. And he's like, get out of here, little guy. You're so cute. You're the cutest little thing ever. Then the scene um, turns into the stuff of nightmares. When this damn thing, this is one of those where I was like, this was too much for a child to watch. Because this thing popping its fucking kite thing and, and the rattlesnake sound that goes with it as it hisses at you gave me nightmares for a very, very long time. So, of Nick, it, here's the thing. Yeah. All right. You, of course, infamously a child of the 80s, right? Yeah. We talk mm -hmm. about this a lot. We talk about the greatest fears, the things you got to look out for, which, of course, include quicksand and lasers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. being a child of the 90s like we got the remnants of that but there was one thing that that really set the fear of god in me and it was poison ivy 
Mm, All right. The idea of poison mm, ivy, everywhere. you got to be careful. It's going to get you no matter what. Everywhere, there everywhere. is something about this creature in this scene that when I was little, I, for some reason, always thought of him as like the living embodiment of poison ivy. I think it had to do with the poison he shot, just the look of him and all this stuff. The red, and the yellow. Was, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like all of that. And that was simultaneously the scariest thing in the world. But because it was scary, it was the coolest thing in the world. This guy <laughs> was always my favorite. I am team this guy. <laughs> Dilophosaurus Rex. The thing that, that I love the most um, about this sequence um, is that we've all been there. We've all been walking through a fucking weird alley like as a kid. And you see a dog that's a little too big to trust. And like, obviously, if Nedru sees a big T-Rex fucking later, I'm fucking mm -hmm. terrified, right? Mm -hmm. If you come across the little, uh, the little tiny ones uh, from mm -hmm. Jurassic Park 3, the whatever, copies. little tiny fucking that. But like, uh, this dinosaur is a little too big to not feel threatened by. And like, when he first sees it, he's like, oh, hey, <laughs> like, it's the same feeling I would get as a kid when you would like. This isn't a chihuahua. This isn't a mm -hmm. fucking wolf. But like, mm -hmm. this dog's a little too big for me to just be cool with. Yeah, <laughs> and like, be that's cautious. that same amount of fear of like, okay, I'm just gonna go over here. <laughs> like, it's so it's so relatable. I guess not everybody's just walked down a dangerous alley. I used to do that. As no, a I'm I'm right there with no, you. I'm yeah, right there with you. If okay. I was a kid and I saw moose, I'd be like, eh, whatever. But if I saw Cecil, I'd be like, hey, hey, buddy, hey, hey, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, for sure, because this Dilophosaurus, like, when it perks its head up, is like. We're pretty much at eye level with him. That's terrifying. Yeah, and of terrifying. course, his his fears are a hundred percent righteous because when he get he gets spit in the eye by this stuff, it's supposed to blind him and paralyze him. And he wipes it out and he gets in his car and he goes, "Oh, I'm safe, thank God." And as he looks over, the damn thing is just sitting in the passenger side seat with him, and it pounces on him and he eats his face off, and it's a gory, horrible death. Grant climbs a tree uh, to find Tim miraculously unscathed. This kid, by the way. You want to talk about someone who's unbreakable. This kid just fell fucking 400 stories in this car. And he's like, <laughs> I pooped my pants. That's the, that's the worst that happened. I vomited all over myself. I flew up. Andy, Do we up? also think the DNA falling from Nedry eventually turned into something? You know, that's a really good point. I know. Yeah. Because I, it's been so long since I've seen this movie that when that happened, I was like, wow, this thing is really lost. They immediately got covered by it, mud and shit. Like, how are they going to get it back? And then they don't. No. It's that. You, I mean, you don't think it ever became says, anything? No, like life finds a way. Uh, uh, uh. Well, well the they, cooling they, agent was only like thirty six hours, 36 right? Hours, yeah. So mm -hmm. after that, the DNA would die, it would spoil. Ah, uh, life finds a way, then, dude. It's very true. You think? So you think? So Andy, you see DNA as sort of like a plant seed, where as long as it goes into the ground, it'll grow a dinosaur. Is that kind of how you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put that okay. shit in soil. Yeah, yeah. Just see what happens. Cool give us some good tree. sunlight. Yeah. Makes sense. That's science right mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. They climb down the tree as the, as the, the car chases after them. I don't even remember this scene. Uh, but then uh, they survive to fight another day, another dinosaur. Ellie and Muldoon arrive on scene, but Alan and the kids are nowhere to be Oh, found the car chasing them. after them. What you meant by that is when the car is falling. It's falling after them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which was cool. Uh, Ellie and Muldoon arrive on scene, but Alan and the kids are nowhere to be found. They do, however, find tracks so they know they're alive. Then they find Gennaro spewing all over the place. I love this part. He goes, he goes, what did you find? He goes, I think this is, I think I found Gennaro. And then all the way on the other side of the hut, Ellie's like, yeah, me too. <laughs> He's just all over the place. <laughs> Thankfully, Dr. Ian Malcolm. Oh, we can survived. add that to the list of terrible deaths. Terrifying deaths. Uh, that and the goat. Put the goat on there because the goat leg hitting the, the, the screen was pretty brutal. Oh, oh, which okay, death the is animal. the best? With, exactly. Which death is the best? Um, Thankfully, Dr. Ian Malcolm is alive. But, Joey, I'm sad to say his buttons did not survive this Ugh. encounter. He is, of course, chest sizzle chest out for the rest of this movie, and I'm not mad at it. They spot another car and climb down to investigate. Uh, they find the footprints. Yeah, yeah. Back on the track, Malcolm hears the telltale sign of the T-Rex coming back for round two, and we get another banger line that would actually become Jeff Goldblum's call sign, which is "Must go faster" as they're trying to outrun the dinosaur, which they do. Very easily, I want to say. T-Rex tops out about 35 miles an hour, so all you have to do is go about 35 and we good. Uh, Grant and the kids hear more scary dino sounds, so they climb a tree for safety, and we get a really, really touching scene here with the bronchiosauruses uh, where they... Where, uh, Brachiosaurus, please get right. Get, get, get yeah. out of here, bro. Pluto's a planet. All right, get, get out of right. here with your bird feathers on these dinosaurs. Um, Nick, Alan Grant would walk up to you and touch you all over and just be like, you're such a 
bitch. Show some respect. Okay? Yeah, I mean, listen, dude, listen. There, as far as I'm concerned, there's only fucking ten dinosaurs. They all have scales, and I had all ten of those. That I had the toys of all of those things. Them, okay? <laughs> I had the toys of every species of dinosaur. All of them. You know, That's all I had. If there was a species of dinosaur Nick knew about. Nick knew about it. <laughs> I love that shirt. so much. So I gotta say, I gotta say that you know, obviously, dinosaurs dope as hell always were, but like were especially cool in the '90s. Like, what happened after Jurassic Park? Mighty Morph and Power Rangers, right? Like, come yeah. the fuck on. I've always, and I'm sure Nothing you have too, different. thought about this where I'm like, all right, we have the five Rangers, right? Each mm-hmm. one of them needs a dinosaur. Why are two of them not dinosaurs? Why is one the saber two tiger? Why is one the mastodon? Yeah, what the fuck man. are you doing? What are you doing? Anyway, very it's weird. Really it's also cool. Those are also cool, though. I'm not mad. Yeah, no, saber two I mean, tiger. Hell yeah. A fucking hairy elephant. Yeah. Fucking but it's, lame. It's big though no nah, but they, they, that thing's eating grass and stuff like uh, is it going some grass <laughs> oh let's see they climb up eat grass i don't know um let's see back at the back of the launch hammond eats ice cream because it's going bad while his grandkids sleep in a tree with a strange man they just met mere hours earlier <laughs> uh, <laughs> fucking weird He's really bummed that Jurassic Park is a failure, but unlike his previous endeavor, a flea circus that was an illusion, he wanted this one to be real for people. Uh, creation is an act of sheer will, he says. The next one will be flawless, to which Ellie fires back. He never had control. That was the illusion. The next morning, Alan and the kids feed a Vegasaurus, and it sneezes all over Lex, and some of it gets in her mouth. Uh, I was eating dinner during this scene, and now I can never eat green salsa from Trader Joe's again. Ugh. <laughs> Uh, on the way back, they stumble across some dinosaur eggs in the wild. Amphibian DNA. Ah, frogs' DNA is used to be was used to fill gaps in the DNA somehow. Uh, but some West African frog. I don't know how the hell Alan Grant knows this as a paleontologist. But he says some West African frogs have been known to spontaneously change sex from male to female in a single sex environment. Malcolm was r- right. Life found a way. Uh, then so cool. God, it's so cool. fucking cool. We get the absolute best shot. In this whole film, which gave us, you want to talk about the the most meme worthy moment in this whole thing? It is the Jeff Goldblum sizzle chest, iconic one shot, completely it's unnecessary, perfect. unbelievably perfect. sweaty, and undeniably unnecessary. Hammond orders Ray to shut down the system, and they talk a little about the lysine contingency, which never comes back. Uh, then they restart the system, but nothing happens. It looks like uh, shutting it down tripped the circuit breakers, which of course are all the way in the maintenance shed on the other side of the compound. Uh, Ray decides to go. Uh, over and out with Alan Grant, they spot a herd of Gallimimuses or whatever running towards Gallimimus. them. Gallimimus. Uh, Gallimimus. They're, 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 Gallimimus. They're, run, they're coming. What does he say? They're running this way, herding this way, packing they're this way? This, they're herding toward us, yeah. Uh so they hide under a big tree which and watch as the T-Rex makes quick work of one of them. It's a horrifying scene. These kids have seen some shit at this point and probably will be traumatized for the rest of their life. Uh, one little helicopter ride, probably not enough to, to erase the hours and hours and hours of dread these kids have had. Ellie gets impatient. Ray hasn't come yet back from the shed and turned the, the power still off. So Muldoon grabs his shoddy and they both head over. Hammond thinks he should go because Ellie's a woman, but she puts him in his place and is like, we'll talk about your misogyny later. Uh, and then they walk <laughs> past the raptor cage oh, and okay. see it torn apart. At this point, I just go right back. I'm like, guys, we're waiting this out. We're staying in this bunker. Uh, the raptors have escaped. Uh, Ellie spots the shed and says, we can make it. Uh, and, and Muldoon says, no, we can't. And she says, why? And we're he goes, because hunted. we're being hunted. Oh, man. And if Holy that's not fuck. enough to send a shiver up your spine, I don't know what is. Uh, he makes Ellie run. He says, well, on the count of three, run and just book it toward the shed. She makes it there unscathed. Uh, again, doing a great job here. Laura, uh, Laura Dern holding up her end of the bargain. Alan and the kids come to another massive electric fence. He tests the wire. Power is still off. Then he plays a very cruel joke on children. Let me remind you, who have seen men die. They've, seen, they've almost been killed themselves. Tim fell down a fucking, like, 300-foot ga- a gap and fell into a tree and almost died five times, threw up all over himself. And Alan Grant's like, you know, it'd be hilarious <laughs> if I pretended like I'm getting shocked to death. Wouldn't that be funny? Uh, I laughed. What are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> We're bad people. We're bad. You have yeah. to find levity in your the situation. You well, it's also in, cute right? when, when, the, when the little Tim kid is like, oh, that was great. Yeah. <laughs> that was funny. That was funny. Uh, then they decide to climb over uh, the, the fence uh, instead of letting the two 80 pound children just climb through the little spaces in the wire where, yeah, I know the one he's like, Oh, I can't climb through here. But if you look up like three rungs, there's a space like this big that the kids could have literally just squeezed through, mm-hmm. but then yeah. it wouldn't get a cool scene. Uh, an alarm goes off. Now Hammond talks Ellie through resetting the breakers and it works. Uh, an alarm goes off on the fence. Uh, Tim 
still has to make it down. Ellie switches all the systems back on. And for some strange reason, the perimeter fences are dead last. Probably the system, Andy, that I would have put right at eye level if we were mm-hmm. resetting everything. Probably yeah. the single most important system in this entire park. Put that one at top. Don't make me bend down for that one. Uh, but also, set design for all of this is immaculate. Awesome. And the, j- the movie, when you really break down like where the characters are and how often they are switched what group they're in and what each group is doing, it's just such a nice rise of tension. And to have this moment now where the characters are separated the way that they are, different heroes having to work together and like doing the whole Star Wars thing of multi-planes of action, this is so damn great. And like you start to feel it where you're like, oh man, you gotta hurry, you gotta hurry. Like these mm-hmm. things, we need the thing on, but also the kid gotta get off. It's mm-hmm. so good. Yeah. It's that classic cutting back and forth where you see it, the camera pans downward, like jibs down and you see that last little bit with perimeter fences and it's red and you're like oh shit someone's about to get shocked of course tim is last on the gate and as the 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 power spools back up tim gets nice. just shocked the fuck off this wire and if i was a betting man andy i'd be like his heart is fried his this bed, kid yeah. gets thrown 30 feet into the air from an electric shock and stands up looking like freaking just with his hair all exploded outward it's hilarious uh back in the raptor shed Actually, he doesn't even stand up. He's not breathing, so they start yeah. administering uh, 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 mouth-to-mouth. Back in the shed, Raptor comes out of freaking nowhere and chases Ellie into Samuel L. Jackson's severed arm, R.I.P. Ray. She bolts back up the stairs and shuts the gate. Uh, shut which, the sh- which, by the way, I didn't know that was Samuel L. Jackson until like a, like five years ago. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I just they, ne- I just never put it together. I just thought yeah. he was another random dude. I don't know why. Well, she says, thank God, Ray. She says his name. She goes, oh, Ray, and then pulls it out, and it's his arm. But I think even then, I didn't even really ever find myself realizing Samuel Jackson's name was Ray in the movie. Maybe he's not. (laughs) He's so used to SLJ, SLJ. Yeah, exactly. We've always called him SLJ our whole lives, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Of course, she lied. The important note here, by the way, she locks this thing in, right? And at the end, I think, oh, we're only going to see two raptors. This damn thing makes it out. It gets out of this thing. It opens the door. Uh, she bolts back upstairs, shuts the gate, crumbles to the ground from the stress of the situation. Great performance here by Laura Dern. Muldoon gets a beat on Mama Raptor, but but uh, Andy, is she a dumb girl or a clever girl? What a f- moment, dude. Clever, clever girl. girl. As this thing oh, comes man. out, just flanks him and just tears him apart. It's uh, so good. Because it's it's this is one of those moments where they set it up earlier, so we know it's going to get a payoff at some point. Mm-hmm. But... As it's happening and you put it together, you see the raptors going around. We like this hunter guy. Like we we're rooting no, for him. We kind of we're like, you're kind of a badass. Like, I want you to survive. But as you start seeing it happen, you as the audience are just like, all right, raptors, gotta give it up. Fuck them up. Fuck them up. <laughs> but even <laughs> as even as the hunter, the hunter's like, hey, game respect game, bro. Like, yeah. I yeah, I'm gonna give it up to you because you put up 44 points and 17 rebounds. Like, that's a good ass game from you, clever yeah, girl. GG's, GG's. Yeah. Uh Alan resuscitates Timmy and they make it back to the lounge. Alan heads outside and yells for Ellie and she spots him. Uh, and as she she sees him, she, you're thinking, oh, she's gonna say I'm over here. But no, instead she yells back, run. <laughs> In another fucking horrifying moment. Inside, the kids help themselves to the buffet. Lex freezes dead in her jello and she spots the silhouette of a raptor behind Timmy. It tracks them into the what kitchen. What another great shot. Great. The yeah. jello shaking. And then you want to talk about great sound design here, Tim. Uh, the raptor caws. He goes, he goes, grr, grr, cool, grr, grr, cool. grr. And cool. the other raptor joins her right by her side. And I got to say, this made wildly thing. different sounds. <laughs> I'm not right, quite sure who. Who is closer? Because right? yeah. like this, it's like. Kra, 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 kra. I wrote it down phonetically. No, but they, they the make like a cool, cool sound. Yeah, they like, cool. they like fucking like make a weird fucking noise. Uh, I'm going to need Cameron Kennedy to, to combine both Andy and I's sounds to make the perfect raptor sound. Thank you very much. <laughs> and they and also, I, the, I'm not paying you for that. Like the so weird screeching sort of and thing. a penguin. Yeah, put a penguin <laughs> in there. Uh, let's see. Lex locks herself in a cabin, or at least she tries to, knocking one of the raptors out in her reflection. Tim bolts and stumbles in the in slippery freezer, which somehow results in them locking one of the raptors in. Uh, the the tension comes- is they're sneaking through all of those, like little uh, not alleyways, but like the little hallway, or, I don't know, mm-hmm. aisles, I guess is probably yeah. the best. Corridors, yeah. Yeah, is so good. And like the reflections and the reflection, the that- man. We don't mm-hmm. like all timer I, sequence. Uh, you didn't need to go that hard. We were yeah. already sold. This was already right. incredible. And then for them to do that, it's just like I had to pause the movie. I had to pause. I had to take a break. Mm-hmm. Uh, the thing that gets me too is the is is the way they're when when Tim hits the uh, spoons, the ladles, and has to stop them for a second. There's that. And then the other thing that gives me tremendous anxiety is when the scene starts. They run around and they hide on one of the sides of it. 
and but the, the, but the, the, the bulge the, the yeah. stainless steel bulge goes boom 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 and it's super loud i'm like don't lean against the fucking thing kid yeah 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 um, but I guess what? these raptors aren't that smart. They can't fucking tell a reflection from a real thing, idiot. <laughs> I mean, they've never <laughs> seen a reflection before. But now they've learned their learning systems. Uh, the other one comes in and chases them into the control room. Alan and Ellie. T- uh, Alan tells Ellie to reboot the door locks, and as he looks back through the window, a raptor is just fucking there, like staring at him, like surprise. Uh, thankfully, Lex knows Unix, which is weird because in 1993, I didn't even know what system. Unix was. Oh, I know Unix. Yeah, they Rumi's set it up. Summer camp. They Did set they? it up perfectly. Oh, yeah, earlier in the movie, they're like Timmy was making fun of her. He's like, I'm not a nerd. You're a nerd. You just sit in your computer all day doing God knows what, watching all that nasty stuff. Dude, and and he was like, role. and she goes, it's called hacking. I'm not a nerd. Yeah. Or for how yeah. she said. <laughs> She's hacking into NORAD to launch nukes. She's like, what it's the set fuck up perfectly. Yeah. And she goes, it's a Unix system. Let me tell I you about this, this Unix system, though. I don't know a lot about Unix systems, but the UI for this thing is the single least effective thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It takes, like, forever <laughs> to scroll over from file to file. It's cool, sure though, man. It's so hey. cool. The fact that it was, like, in a built-in a 3D space is so inefficient. Like, it's just so give us a folder structure. Yes. <laughs> but it looks so cool. <laughs> uh, she reboots the door locks as Alan manages to shut the Raptor out. Grant calls Hammond and tells him the phones are working. Call the mainland. Tell them to send helicopters. Uh, the raptors come through the glass and Grant can't shoot for shit. So they head up to the drop ceiling where the aliens got into that one room in the movie Aliens. Uh, the raptor pops his head up like a damn jack in the box and Lex almost falls to her death, but they catch her and save her at the last minute. Then they head Another out. great shot of Another her just shot. up top in the... Uh. And she's just like riding a The little tension bit. of this, I've seen this a million times, but I'm still so stressed out by the entire last 30 minute sequence specifically. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, of course, wind up on the T-Rex bones, and when the raptor jumps down, it all breaks apart, and they're all spinning and trying to do this and that. And then they fall to the ground and come face to face with another raptor and get surrounded by them. But right before the second raptor is about to pounce, good old T-Rex, who apparently was just chilling outside waiting for the right time to come in. Here's the commotion, and, get, and, he's, and he's hungry, man. So he comes in and he eats one of the raptors. The other one, of course, seeing uh, a predator that he has to deal with, jumps on his back and scratches him. Very important scratches the t-rex is back uh then the t-rex grabs him throws him through the freaking dinosaur bones and just owns his ass as the banner for jurassic park comes sprinkling down and falling to the floor in front of him another iconic movie shot. fucking perfect. magic it's mm-hmm. this my friends this is the best moment of the movie i know i've said it before but oh my god i love that they're just like all right cool let's let, what is up jurassic park at the end of the day is it a on-sparring movie is it a horror movie is it a little bit of both is it blah 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 at the end of the day, the T-Rex gets the hero shot. It's about the dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. And this moment is what sells that entirely. The humans are just there. The T-Rex came to fuck up those raptors. And all of a sudden, the thing that we were scared of the entire movie, we are cheering for. How cool is that? That is power. That is wrestling at its best. When all of a sudden, the heel beats the good guys, and the, then the heel beats the badder guys, and you're like, "This, I'm, I'm cheering for this bad guy. It's the best." And the USA uh, logo pops up to him, and it's like, "Oh, it's mm-hmm. over. Money yeah. that raws it's over, dude." Yep. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Alan, Ellie, and the kids get picked up by Hammond outside, and as they do so, Alan says, "Mr. Hammond, after careful consideration, I've decided not to endorse your park." <laughs> to which Hammond replies, "So have I." Uh, T Rex owns the final raptor. The banner falls. Grant, Alan, Ellie, Hammond, and Malcolm, and the kids, uh, make it to the helicopter. But before they take off, Hammond stops to take one last look at the living nightmare that is Jurassic Park. On the plane ride home, the kids once again fall asleep, nuzzle up to Alan, and he locks eyes with Ellie. Ellie takes a picture with her eyes, like my wife tells me to do, instead of actually bothering her on our vacations by taking a real picture, and we see a flock of normal, non-dinosaur birds flying into the sunset. The end. And they never made another movie. Nope. That was perfect. It. That you was it. it. Lightning in the bottle. Lightning in the bottle. I hope you guys yeah, enjoyed yeah. Jurassic Park in review. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> Number one. Yeah. Uh, and hit me with haiku in review, please. Seven syllables in the middle. You need five for the first and last line. If it's not poetic, no need to fret it. Haikus don't need to rhyme. Haiku in review. Haiku in review. You can go to patreon.com slash kind of funny to write your review in haiku form. Just like Mr. Pedro Rocks 01 did. Life uh, finds a way. Uh, uh. Truer words never spoken. Five films and counting. <laughs> uh, Joe Merton says, hold on to your butts. It's stupid, sexy Malcolm. Is that on the tour? And then, of course, 
miscellaneous writes in with the plot and haiku. Hammond cuts the checks. Expert come, inspect subjects. You've got a T-Rex? Ah. From the tour they stray, the cloning lab, then they survey. Life, uh, finds ah. a way. <laughs> Nedry's right. got no sense. Control was a false pretense. We spared no expense. Wow. Wrap your cage in shreds. They hunt down these three bipeds. Clever girl, he says. They have become prey, but before raptors can slay, T-Rex saves the day. Miscellaneous. Oh, Come nice. on. So good. I always love it. Uh, let's do Ragu Bagu. Do, 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 do. Ragu. Do, 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 do. Bagu. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Rad Guys Talk. Bad Guys here for Jurassic Park in review. I guess on this is another one of those weird asterisk ones where I, I would argue there's not too many bad people in this, but I guess we could put Nedry and Human Greed or I mean, Scientific I, Innovation on this one. What do you want to do? I or do you want to put think- Nedry and Hammond? Yeah, I think it's I think it's Nedry. Like, I don't think yeah. that there. This is one of those examples of like, there's not a bad guy. He's the bad guy. Okay. He's stealing well, think, the tech for Hammond's yeah, like adversary. I just, I just think when I think bad guys, I think of like a direct adversary for the protagonist of this movie. But Nedry is just kind of like he just. I guess he did. He is kind of the bad guy. So we'll put him at number one. Sabotaging the locks and all that yeah. shit. Yeah, like, the saboteur. Not necessarily in hopes that it kills people, but to like further his gain. You know. You know what this? You know what the biggest. Like the biggest, the saddest thing he did, though, like the, the worst thing he did this whole movie, was that he never came back with those salty snacks. Oh, so <sighs> sad, dude. That's that's yeah. the biggest heartbreaker. <laughs> Took me a long time to um, set that bad joke up. Obviously, <laughs> obviously, we're going to to rank Jurassic Park as number one because there's nothing to to even go off yet. Um, but I did want to get Greg Miller's very brief but important. I also have the feedback. dinosaur death list. Oh, we oh we'll get to that, Disney. Joe. Do okay. not worry. Do not worry. Do not fret, Mona me. Um, Greg Miller says, I think Jurassic Park is one of those perfect movies, and I'll never forget going to see it as part of Mike Boylan's birthday. I'm sure we'll hear more from him later when it comes to Jurassic Park next week when he comes here. But I, I would like to introduce a new segment, a new podcast within a podcast inspired by one Joey Noel. Um, I'm going to call it Dino Soars because they make people oh. sore. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Oh, Dino okay. Soars. S-O-R-E. I don't yes, thank love you. S O R E, but I do want the colon, like the subtitle. So, dinosaurs, uh-huh. which death is the Beth? Okay, <laughs> Andy, we got to repeat you. that. Thank you. Thank you. You fixed it. Mm-hmm. it was, there was a scratch on it. You, you painted it. Beth. Mm-hmm. Great. Mm-hmm. So, Joey, Great. what do we got? What do we got here? So, we have we have a few. We have the beginning goat or the cage man that gets pulled through with the really bad arm hold. Sure, ta. Yeah. Then we have the goat leg death, which Nick just requested. Mm-hmm. Terrifying. Just the, just that particular goat and mm-hmm. the leg that mm-hmm. fell on the thing. Mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. Not any of the Nick other. Nick knows animals. the goat in real life. He's just vouching for him. Okay. okay. Uh, then we have. <laughs> <laughs> Why did that get us? <sighs> Why? Because you're all on my level now. You're all on my level. <laughs> And please play the Hammond gif. I really hate that. (laughs) Uh, We have the Gennaro bathroom death. Not pooping. Uh, We have Nedry and the Dilophosaurus. Samuel L. Jackson and the raptor, which happens off screen. But we can imagine if you get your arm torn off, it's not great. Uh, Muldoon and the raptors. And then T-Rex murdering the raptors at the end, I feel like should also be included. I say for this segment, we choose just the one, one death I for the movie, and then we can rank it against the other movies as they go. I got to give it. And I'm biased, but I got to yeah. give it to the Nedry death. And I think it's just an oh, iconic dinosaur, terrifying. great buildup. Everything about it's so good. But I think one of my favorite aspects about it is how surprising the end is. Mm-hmm. Like, we knew he was going to die. I didn't expect him to pop up in the car, you oh. know? And I just mm-hmm. feel like it was just like a, that one last little element at the end of terrifying. it. And I'm like... Damn, they got me even one step further than I expected. So and that the, would be my vote. The scream, very visceral. Like, you could tell he went all out in that ADR room. Mm-hmm. It, it has this very, like, ah! like, it has a very, like, <laughs> I am terrified right now kind of vibe. And I'll there is it. something to be said about the shot where they pull away and they just show the car and all you see is the shadows. And, like, sometimes the things that you don't see are scarier mm-hmm. than the things that you do. So I would agree with that. Yeah. I'll, I'll concur. Unanimous. Okay. That that part was terrifying. And well done. Adding it to the list. Cool. There Add we go. The there we go. That death was um, the best. 
death was the beth everybody uh thank you for joining us for the first ever uh first ever episode of jurassic park in review next week we will return with the lost world jurassic park uh and greg miller will be a part of that so that is very Vince exciting Vaughn, stuff. baby oh dude i i gotta say i'm so yeah. excited to watch this one because i also haven't seen it in a long time mm. and i i know that people say it's horrible but as a kid there was nothing cooler than the the van over the the mountainside situation mm. so well, so we'll see we'll see will it be number one i don't know everybody we'll have to wait till next week to find sure. out yeah. but until then thank you so much for hanging out if you want to watch more fun content youtube.com slash kind of funny we just posted our sonic the hedgehog 2 review you can check that out as well as a whole bunch of other really cool stuff like our moon knight review but until next week andy good goodbye lophosaurus <laughs> it's 